Mr. Chair, you're alive. All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Planning Commission virtual public meeting on Thursday, November 18th, uh, 2021 at 7 p.m. Calling this meeting to order. Roll call, please, Kimberly. Mr. Sale. Here. Mr. Imes. Here. Ms. Butler. Here. Mr. Pline. Present. And Mr. Waldman is absent tonight. That is correct. So we have quorum, we may proceed. Uh, looking at the agenda that we have ahead of us, I'll go ahead and scroll down it so we can actually approve that and get in good order of the minutes, then followed by the public uh, hearings of major site design for Primrose, for Knesset Israel, and then the major site design plan review uh, for the Crab Boating Center and unfinished business. After that, go to page two, and of course, adjournment. And the next meeting will be Thursday, December 2nd. And this is our agenda. Of course, there'll be some slight modifications probably as we go through the meeting today with who wants to do what, but as it stands, that's what it is. Anyone uh, have any beefs with the agenda? I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. I'll second that motion as written. Any other further discussion? All those in favor of the agenda as it stands, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, the agenda will continue as is. Moving on to the approval of minutes. Uh, there was a draft minutes sent out by Kimberly and uh, anyone have any issue with that? You can review it on your own, on your computer. Give everybody a second or two to bring up their paperwork if they need to. I move we adopt uh, the minutes as written. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'll second that motion. And any further discussion? And for members of the public, I'm displaying it here before we finalize that. Any other further discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor of the minutes as written, say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? And any abstentions? Actually, I need to abstain because I wasn't present. Okay, but you uh, did send me an email that you uh, reviewed the entire meeting on YouTube. Is that correct? I did. Okay. Hello, Moto. That's quite old. That was interesting there. Thanks for the throwback. <laughs> <laughs> throwback to the... 2015 era, maybe. Okay, uh, back to the serious point there. So, Diane, you can comment on these if you'd like, and uh, in my opinion, vote on them if you'd want to, uh, based on you watch the whole move, whole YouTube uh, presentation. So, yeah, we actually uh, had a legal opinion on that last meeting. Oh, remind me then, Dave. Well, I think Mr. Beard said that if they had if they had reviewed it, then they could comment on or be part of it. Is, isn't that what we said last the last meeting? That's correct. That's what I thought. <clears throat> Mr. Beard? Yes, that's correct. All right. Correct. All right. Well, then I'm correcting my assumptions then, or my assessments. Thank you very much, Mr. Iams, for backing me up. Okay. Um, all those in favor, say uh, aye again. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Fantastic. Unanimously passed minutes. 
We'll stop that share. And then back to the back to the agenda. Okay. Now we're moving on from the minutes. Uh, there was uh, an item I'd like to hit before we get into the uh, presentations of the actual. Uh, excuse me. Let me get back to this agenda. The public hearings. Before we get back to the public hearings, might as well share it while I'm talking about it. <laughs> That's the wrong thing. There it is. Okay, before we go into the uh, public hearings uh, for major site design, there it is. Good grief, let's stop share. That's not going so well. Um, there was uh, communications back and forth about uh, legal issues for uh, code enforcement uh, versus leases uh, that were done on properties that the city leases out, and most notably the Maritime Museum and also the Crab Project that is proposed. Before we start talking about that legally, I'd just like to get it uh, sensibly thought out from legal Mr. Beard. When should we broach that subject? So we broach it when we go into the item uh, for the public hearing, or should we broach it now as an item outside of that, or wait till after all of that is agenda? I think you should broach it um, either during the meeting or after, after you've had a discussion about the facts that apply. Uh, I'm actually, I'm, I'm meaning in, within the agenda we have tonight, where would you think we would fit that in sensibly mm -hmm. on a legal perspective? Right during the meeting when you get into it. When we get into the crab facility. Okay, well, we'll do that right when we get into that then. Um, coming back now. Okay, well then we'll move right into public hearings for the first item on the agenda. We'll go right for staff. And this is a continuation item from our uh, from meetings past. And the title of that item, just for public's interest again, is SDP 2020-005. That is the E-Track uh, item number. Major site design plan review application by Primrose School Franchising Company and uh, contract purchaser and Nesseth Israel Synagogue property owner for the development of an early learning and child care facility located at the intersection of Spa Road and Hilltop Lane. And the last public hearing we had on this was two meetings ago, October 7th, and this is the continuation. So over to staff for status of this uh, public hearing item updates. Mr. Chairman, good evening. Uh, Tom Smith, Chief of Current Planning. I'm actually going to uh, turn it over to the applicant's legal counsel, Mr. Dales. I think he's going to request a continuance. We thought that. Okay, Mr. Philip Dales, please. Applicant's uh, representation. Hey. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman Sale. We are going to request a continuance tonight, but I'll provide a, a brief update on what's happened since the last meeting. Um, please do. Take your time. heard the comments of the... Thank you. We, uh, we heard the comments of the commissioners and um, thought that the concerns were focused on all of the potential U-turns that would occur on residential streets um, for the turnarounds after passing the school for the right-in, right-out condition um, that, uh, that the access was proposed to be. And so our traffic engineers uh, pulled together four alternatives to avoid those issues. There are four different um, uh, potential solutions. Um, three of them involve changes to the timing of the signal and um, lane configurations, and one involves off-site parking. Um, after uh, an initial meeting with the Department of Public Works, um, the traffic engineer, traffic concepts working for us, um, responded to some of the comments in the initial meeting to adjust their simulation um, in Synchro, which is a traffic engineering program. And the, the, the plan was for traffic concepts to share that uh, simulation with DPW so that they could work towards the preferred alternative of the four. Um, and I understand that the Department of Public Works had some difficulty bringing together the people that they wanted to be in that meeting to review the simulation. And so now there is a meeting set for them to go over that simulation together. It's set for Tuesday, but at this point, we don't have a consensus on which of the alternatives is the best one to uh, propose to you 
as a modification of that access. But I, I can report that all four alternatives being considered would avoid the need to pass the site coming from the west and use the residential streets to the north of the hilltop for turnarounds. And all four solutions involve um, a change to allow traffic to move through if it, when leaving the site and going west to go through the intersection and not have to be forced north onto SPA such that they would have to make similar turnarounds on SPA if they wanted to go anywhere other than um, towards downtown Annapolis north on SPA. So um, I would respectfully request uh, um, the continuance um, again tonight so that the Department of Public Works and Traffic Engineering our traffic consultants can go through those alternatives together and we can bring back a proposal that has consensus with city staff and the applicant. Mr. Dales, that sounds fantastic. Uh, and to help you out uh, with the flow of this and make it most efficient for the developer to, you know, to forego any excess cost, let's, uh, we could talk of, of just a little bit about it tonight. Uh, if you have anything more than that to show us, I don't think you do, but uh, from the commissioners, have if the commissioners have, well, if the commissioners have questions, uh, that we can get them out to you now rather than hiding that till later. Also, I want to think that uh, we're in the middle of the public hearing on this, and it, this sounds like it's going to be a pretty major change. Uh, that would mean, in my opinion, that it's going to come back to the commission, and we're going to have to give the public proper notice and then hear it twice again so the public can make comment. Um, that sounds logical to me. I'm, I'm pretty sure Mr. Beard will probably back me up on that. Uh, so hear me out, Mr. Beard. I'm almost done. So get it uh, back to us. But before we it comes back to us almost as a planning commission when we have big projects like this is we have working groups on the side before they come to us to preclude any major drawn out issues as it comes uh, through the planning commission. And I know we already have a lot on our agenda, but to give an hour, one night, maybe work session or something, what do you commissioners feel? Is there any need for that? Or does it sound logical or do we just wait for it to have, come right back to us? Commissioners, what do you feel? And Mr. Beard as well. I think you have either option available, whichever is more practical here. Okay. I'm always in favor of work session kinds of things because they are essentially off the record. In, so we can discuss those idea, you know, kick ideas around more frankly. May I um, add something, Chairman Sale? Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, I'll add two things. One, we, we also had a community meeting um, at the synagogue and invited the gentry neighbors to attend and, and quite a few did. Some watched uh, virtually. And um, I think many of the concerns that they had were um, sufficiently addressed. And I think we'll hear from those residents when we're back at a full public hearing and um, not just asking for a continuance. And the second thing that I would add, which, which is responsive to your comments to Chairman Salo, is that the all four alternatives essentially change what's under your review in the same way. You guys are reviewing the site design plan, which is the limits of the site. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the changes won't be, all four changes just involve um, the, uh, the, the change to the right in, right out access. The, the things that are different about the alternatives are where uh, DPW has jurisdiction over Hilltop um, and Spa. And, and so, you know, that median that we had shown before, that raised barrier mm -hmm. to channelize everything onto Spa will, would change. Um, and the actual access um, into the site to prevent left turns would change. But I don't know that it is such a major change in the sense that it, from a site design perspective, the only thing changing is the access. And then the consequences of that are, um, I think, significant, as you all pointed out in the last meeting, the offsite consequences of that changed access will, will be significant for the residents to the east on Hilltop and to the north on Spa, but the site okay. design itself has changed. So what I'm hearing here is you don't think it would, uh, nor do you sound like you want a uh, another work session. And I, should, I should be clear, we would be amenable to it if you decided to do that, but I would just suggest to you that the site design changes themselves are not so significant. Okay. That would be I'm trying to be the most efficient here and help you out and preclude any issues where you Thank bring you. it to us and we have commissioner problems. But what I'm hearing, I'm, I guess I don't think we would have too many big commissioner problems from what we would hear. And since we're gonna hear it twice anyway, it has to be real in the public for such a major change uh maybe having a work session would be just a bit too much commissioners what do you think we'd hear it twice anyway yeah i don't think it's necessary if it's just a matter of, I, I i don't if they don't think it's necessary then i don't 
We can always continue it longer if we need to. That's a good point. That's a good point. And uh, doesn't sound like Mr. Dales really would need it, but he's okay if we wanted it. Okay. Um, all right. Well, so what we're hearing from the uh, applicant, uh, any other commissioners have questions of the applicant at the moment? Is there anything you want to see now or, or have them work on before they come back? Okay, they've gotten our thoughts from the last meeting. Uh, one last question. We do have uh, some uh, representation from the city council here. Any of the city council here specifically for this project or is it for the other project? I'm here for this one. You are? Okay. Um, and public comment is still open. Uh, and if we did have people talk, I guess it would be more efficient to have co some comments be made now. If they're here. Let's get the comments in for the house of the future. Commissioners, I'm seeing Alex is in agreement with that. Dave, Diane. Oh, okay, good. All right. Well, I'd like to, uh, and Mr. Beard, before we start getting public comment, any issue with uh, what the developer wants for the continuance and bringing it back? No. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Beard, our legal counsel. All right. Well, I'd love to hear from uh, the city council members first, since they represent such large groups. And then also, Julian, if we have anybody else who wants to add in public comment tonight for this item, let's go ahead and hear it. And Mr. Dales, any issue with that? Makes sense, no, right? Good. We, we, we would appreciate any um, feedback or comments the commissioners have that would help us in that Tuesday meeting with the Department of Public Works. So if you do want to give us a sense of uh, how you'd guide our solutions or assessment of those alternatives, uh, I'll, of course, bring that to the meeting. All right. We appreciate it, Mr. Dales. It does sound like you got a good uh, ballpark of what we thought from the last meeting. Sounds like you're heading it. Okay. So, uh, Julian, do you have anybody other than the council members? Please look them up. I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, Mr. Schoenemeyer at the moment. Alderman Schoenemeyer, please uh, give us your five minutes or so. What you have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like to say that um, there was a very productive meeting between uh, the members of Congregation Knesset Israel, uh, representatives from the Primrose School, including Mr. Dales, and um, members of the Gentry community uh, that was hosted last week. Uh, it was a very productive meeting a lot of the concerns were actually addressed. And um, with all the negotiating and working that um, the Primrose Project has done with the city to get everything in line and in compliance, and if this barrier issue is addressed, I do think that this project should go through. It's um, gonna be providing some very essential childcare services and it's a very essential program for the synagogue. That's my time. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Schellemeyer, Ward 5 representation. Any other uh, council members that would like to speak on the issue? Okay, Mr. Uh, Julien, any other uh, representatives from the public that would like to speak? Yeah, first we have uh, Jonathan Goldsmith. Mr. Goldsmith, please go ahead. Hello again, and good to see you all back. And I am going to assume that uh, all the commissioners got my statement and read it. And of course, much of it was talking about that meeting that Phil already addressed and uh, Alderman Schandelmeyer already addressed. So I'm not going to repeat that. The only thing I wanna point out is that I know uh, Mr. Pline and Ms. Butler had significant concerns and I know uh, Ms. Butler is significantly concerned on environmental issues and, and uh, basically, quite frankly, diversity type things. Okay, well, certainly diversity. And, and uh, all I can tell you is this helps the neighborhood. I was just looking up on the, on the web. What can I tell you? Uh, I, I, this, this helps, uh, certainly this helps the neighborhood. Yes, there are daycare centers there and it just gives another a good variety. And uh, you have to give credit to Primrose uh, where credit is due. Uh, they would not be pursuing this if this wouldn't work for them. So that's number one. And I know, uh, Mr. Pline, your concerns. I understand you're a major biking advocate, as am I. And, uh, and I bike all over this county on my road bike. And I do know that the concern is everything should always be as good as possible, certainly for bicyclists and pedestrians. And uh, quite frankly, in its own little way, uh, they are making uh, some improvement of that on the street. And I know, I know strodes are not a good thing. Uh, those uh, things between streets and roads, I get that. 
Uh, but uh, I, this, I do not believe, as, uh, as the studies have shown, that this will affect that. Uh, we can't solve uh, world hunger and world peace uh, with this, and we can't solve this area of the strode either. Uh, so uh, I'm just, again, speaking that this just makes sense, all the sense in the world, and I just look forward to it going forward. And I thank you very much. And just, just uh, one, one comment about that. I'm, I'm not looking at this completely from, from a, a bike standpoint, by the way. I'm actually looking at it from a motor standpoint, quite uncharacteristic. Um, so I just wanted to make that statement. Well, I, yes, sir. So. And I, I appreciate that. And uh, again, I'm just going to, uh, I'm a great believer in, in uh, listening to the SMEs, the subject matter experts. And, uh, and certainly Primrose has their own. And of course, the city has hired their own. And it seems like with this change that is being proposed, things will work uh, for the betterment of not just the school and that corner, because the last thing we want to do is uh, put gravel all over that corner. Nothing's happening to that corner right now. It makes sense for something productive for the entire community to be there. And so that's, you know, that's all we're, we're hoping. And yes, obviously, we'd like to sell the land. So thank you. And Mr. Goldsmith, if I may, I... Um... I just want to comment. I have been accused of being an environmentalist. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> and, not a bad thing to be. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, I would say that yeah, normally uh, I do care about the environment, but I think um, the applicant and the city have done a really good job at protecting some of the, uh, the big specimen trees here. And yes, so I have none of my concerns really related to the environment, but, but thank you for noting that I am an environmentalist. <laughs> okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Goldsmith, thank you very much. Anyone else from uh, Mr. Julian Jacks? Yeah, Shock. next we have Mr. Lawrence Goldstein. Mr. Goldstein. Yes, and this is Lawrence Goldstein. And in light of the details that Phil Dales has given tonight and uh, what Jody Goldsmith also has said, there's no reason for me to take any more of your time. I appreciate your continued effort to, to help out with this project and make sure it's the best that there can be. And uh, I, I withdraw my request to speak. Thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Goldstein, thank you very much. But if you have anything to add again on our next meeting, please feel free to call in again. Love to hear from you. Any other uh, representation from the community? Mr. Chair, that is everyone. All right, Mr. Jacques, thank you very much. Uh, and Phil, thank you very much for uh, this uh, continuance. Uh, would you have an idea on the timeline? I mean, I, yeah, you know what? Next week's wait, Thanksgiving and holidays. Uh, I'm going to guess late January, maybe first meeting in February. Would that be correct? No, I, I think that we, we expect a solution out of this meeting on Tuesday. And, um, you know, if that meeting goes as, as we hope, then the only thing we've done all the heavy lifting, the, the difficult work of developing the alternatives. It'll now mm -hmm. just be going to the city's traffic engineer to update the TIA, um, and then for us to present, you know, the, the chosen solution to you at the very next meeting here, which is, I believe, December 2nd, um, if that's right. That, so that is, that is correct. Uh, we would like to be back here on December 2nd with a final proposal to you. Okay. And if that doesn't happen. Ben, Ben, so, but did you want this re-advertised or are we just, are you going to continue it to that specific meeting? We don't need to re-advertise if it's continued. Hold right? on, Thank Mr. Dales. Hold on, Mr. Dales. I, I'm trying to that. find out what Ben had said earlier. Um, I had mentioned re-advertising, but Mr. Dales is, uh, is, I believe, correct. And Mr. Breed will back me up. We are in the middle, middle of meeting, and we don't have to re-advertise since the meeting's being continued, and we keep doing this every meeting, and we have posted it for a meeting. So I don't think we need to re-advertise. If they want to come back on December 7th, 2nd uh, with the changes, is but the public does need to have at least two weeks to have that information. So you would have to have that two weeks prior to December 2nd, which ironically is past. Uh, Chairman Sale, I think if we came back to you on the second to show you what we've come up with, and you're gonna have a second meeting anyway, because of the rules yeah. related to virtual meetings. That, that would count. Would be, yeah. That would count. Okay, um, let's just keep in mind that we've committed the second meeting in December and both meetings in January to Providence, the Providence Point group for their exclusive presentations on that project. 
I, I, would I, know, I, know, I know what they're giving uh, uh, for that first one, and it's going to be specifically them presenting to us. I think we can fit in our agenda time okay. for this project. I just want to really make think. sure you feel you have the time for all of that. Yeah, because when I, I mean, we're talking about a traffic change, entry, and exit. We've already got the okay. basics of the property, the design of the building, everything else. So, so are you feeling that we can wrap this up at the December second meeting and not continue it again? Uh, to be that fair, would be uh, ideal in uh, terms of your scheduling. No, because then the changes for the public wouldn't be two weeks out. So I would think okay. that I would rather have them. You know, we continue, and then if there's nothing major from the public, we hear about that mid-December meeting. It's just a stamp at that point. So I, yes, I we also have to. We're also going to be wrapping up Bay Village on the 16th, and then starting Providence Point. That, that, I just want to get great. it all out there so you're aware of what you're committing to. I get it. I get it. But to be fair. Okay. Uh, Mr. Dales and his gang was here first, and we're hearing them right. before the okay. rest. And we'll, get, we'll get through them as we can as a community. You know, it's not, everything's not so pressing. We're going to die if that doesn't happen. So I think it's fair. We can do it. Thank you, Ms. Rouse, for your concern. So let's add okay. it. Commissioners, any issue with that? Perfect. Let's rock on. Mr. Dales, anything else? No, Chair Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Wonderful. So you're continued to December 2nd while you will present to us your changes that you're working with DPW. And Mr. Chandelmeyer, we welcome you back at that time as well as members of the community. Good. Thank you. Thanks again. All right. All right. We'll thank move you. on from that item. Uh, let me see if I can share this. There we go. All right. So we're on from public hearing item number one to item number two. Major site design plan review application by the city of Annapolis, who is the property owner for the redevelopment of a piece of property that they are leasing. Uh, it's on the old Port Williams Marina property, uh, and they're going to lease it into the Chesapeake Region Accessible Boating Center. It's also called CRAB Annapolis uh, on property located at 7040 Bemby Beach Road. And this public hearing is held open from November 4th, 2021. So again, for members of the public, the city owns this property and is going to lease it to Crab uh, for, to make an accessible boating center uh, for people out there, which is gonna be fantastic. Um, so, okay, let's this item is continued. Uh, we'll go ahead over to staff and what do you have to add to the issue? And I'll give staff a minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you should have received, I'm filling in from Ms. Goudinius this evening. Uh, you should have received uh, a number of correspondence from both Ms. Goudinius and myself. Uh, one of them being uh, a memorandum um, from November the 15th, where I believe she provided some responses to 10 of the uh, commission's questions from the previous meeting. Um, I believe she has forwarded a number of comments uh, with possible conditions from Commissioner Waldman, who couldn't be here this evening. Uh, I believe she also forwarded uh, some comments from the um, CRAB organization uh, in reference to events. Uh, she forwarded, uh, I believe, some uh, additional comments and correspondence from the owners of 7046 Bendy Beach Road. And I sent you a number of public comments that were received prior to uh, noon today. Uh, excuse me, and one more item, I believe Ms. Goudinis also forwarded you a revised planting plan uh, for the project. And I will tell you that was a mountain of stuff to review since Monday uh, to today. So I, I wasn't able to get to exactly all of it, I'll be honest with you. I don't know about the rest of the commissioners, a ton of stuff, but we're gonna talk about it here tonight for sure. Um, Anything to highlight else at the top than those items? I'm happy to discuss any of those items, Mr. Chairman. And I believe the applicant is prepared to discuss them as well. All right. And uh, before we uh, get to the applicant, uh, there was a, a big elephant in the room of city leasing a piece of property and uh, in the lease or possibly in the lease, allowing things that are against code, but yet stay saying, I guess in the code that, you know, obviously code must be adhered to. So there was that issue and Mr. Beard uh, wrote a nice response to us. Uh, and Mr. Beard, would you like to elaborate on that now? Uh, and also the city attorney may want to chime in. Uh, well, as your counsel, 
Um, the lease does say that the lessee must abide by zoning requirements. L lease for who? Um, the lease that the city has. It for says Brown. in there. Yes. Thank you. And it sa says it must abide by the zoning requirements. Now, if the board, as it does in uh, other matters, imposes conditions, it has to be based on authority from the code. And if the majority can articulate the code that applies, and there is the review criteria in 21.22.080, and it sets forth uh, A through H, the various review criteria. If members uh, can apply that consistent with the lease that uh, says zoning requirements must be abided by, consistent with that, um, they may, the, the commission may impose conditions um, relating to the use of the premises of the property and other requirements. As long as it's consistent, as long as it's reasonable and uh, applies the standards in the code. So the short answer is um, the discussion, if it addresses that and in the questions and in the uh, deliberations um, and supports it with reasoning, it may impose uh, conditions of consistent with the code, including relating to um, the type of use that there's there, whether it's access and hours and so forth, as long as they describe where the source of the authority is. And I've directed it to where that is. Okay, Mr. Beard, thank you very much. Uh, in my mind, we're here at the commission to uh, look at the project, impose conditions as we see fit and are able to do according to code. Uh, and we expect that the code will be followed for the property by the city and the applicant. Now, if the city goes and gives a lease to somebody to do something other than what's in the code, I don't believe operational city has the authority to do to give somebody the ability to go against code unless it comes through the planning and zoning department and that uh, non-conforming use is granted. Um, we do have a new planning and zoning director tonight uh, that we have yet to introduce to the crowd. Probably should have done that earlier. And if he wants to chime in, I know he's watching here, but if he wants to chime in on that, feel free. But so it, th there's a whole lot of, uh, there was a whole lot of talk in the last two weeks about uh, existing properties the city leases out where they're doing things that are not conforming to code. And then uh, it's said that it's okay via the lease. Now the crab lease, they can have whatever lease they want with the city. As, as far as the planning commission is concerned, we just have to hope that the city and them are going to follow code. I mean, that's the law. As far as us being worried about that, it's almost, me, it seems like it's further down the road out of our bailiwick. Uh, so is that correct, Mr. Beard? Am I following that right or am I not getting it? No, you're getting it. And then that is also the authority for this commission to impose conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's correct. Yep. So I think they're kind of two separate things. So we can impose conditions all we want. Uh, commissioners, uh, any other ideas, comments for, with regard to that subject? So it's 21.22080. Is that what you were saying, Mr. Beard? Is where those criteria were? Yes, I that's a, that is for site design review. Okay, any other comments from staff or the city attorney, Joel? Any other issues you had chimed in on some other things before? Uh, well, as Mr. Beard uh, has suggested, he said after the facts are settled, we can understand what the law is. As the facts are not quite yet settled and the board has taken no action, the commission has taken no action, I don't have an opinion until I understand what the facts are. And, um, and, and if I do have a difference of opinion, at some point, uh, we'll cross that boundary. But I don't know what the facts are, so I don't know what the law should be. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Braithwaite. Um, all right. Well, we're here as a commission to review the uh, project that is is and if any other changes and set conditions as we see fit. Um, staff, any other changes to the development design before we ask the developer or the applicant to uh, give us a briefing? Uh, Mr. Chairman, other than the um, minor modifications to the planting plan, I'm not aware of any others, but I will certainly defer to Mr. Bollinger and his consultants. 
Okay. Commissioners, last call for staff questions. All right, let's move on to the applicant then. Any changes in uh, or issues to make us aware of before we go into any further public comments and del deliberations? Uh, Mr. Chairman, my name is James Nolan, and I'm an attorney in Annapolis. My office is at 125 West Street, Annapolis, Maryland, and I'm also a resident of the city. I reside at 55 Arundel Road, Annapolis, Maryland, both 21401. Um, I've been asked to assist CRAB. Uh, I would also indicate to you that I am on the board of CRAB after providing numerous years of pro bono legal services to assist CRAB in working through uh, this particular program open space process that involves the state, the county, the city, and here we are. Um, and so I am uh, here tonight to sort of assist uh, at the request of the board of CRAB and Mr. Bollinger, the executive director. So with that in mind, um, I would like to point out a couple of things uh, based upon a review of the hearing that took place last time and also um, a listening to comments that have been made by various people. And a couple of things that I think are extremely important, important to point out, uh, and that is this. CRAB is a nonprofit organization that is celebrating its 30 years of providing uh, boating and sailing opportunities for uh, citizens of our area and the entire state who are disabled. This includes people who are military veterans, wounded warriors, uh, and others who have uh, unfortunately uh, encountered uh, situations that have caused them to become disabled. Um, their lives are somewhat limited and CRAB has been there to give them an opportunity to enjoy the benefits of the waters in our area, uh, just like other citizens. So for 30 years, we've been doing that. CRAB has been operating, and I think you all know this, from Sandy Point State Park. And a few years ago, we began a very comprehensive effort of trying to find our own home. So for the last, literally, it's, well, two, three years, uh, the process has been going on, which involved um, trying to uh, become eligible for project open space grants, uh, which would provide the funding to allow the ultimate uh, creation of what's been referred to as the Adaptive Boating Center. So this project has gone on for years and years and years. And I would just like to cover one topic that I know has come up and has become very a very hot topic, uh, an important topic in the Annapolis uh, area, and that is public access to the water. Um, I was involved uh, significantly in the recently passed ordinance 02521, which revised the maritime zoning. Uh, and so I know that it was a big issue that was dealt with there, and I commend the city for addressing it uh, very significantly. But dropping back, um, the first thing I would like to point out, again, beyond the fact that CRAB is a nonprofit, CRAB is not making money for itself or for stockholders or other individual owners. Uh, it's an organization that there is there to help citizens. They just happen to be people with disabilities. And I think that is very, very important. It's very important to understand that everyone who utilizes the services of CRAB and who will utilize them at this new adaptive boating center on the former Williams Marina site, we are remaining a marina. We are just catering to members of the public who have disabilities. So everything we do is providing public access to the water. It's just that the focus here is on citizens, uh, members of the public who are disabled, and quite frankly, who do, do not have other opportunities available to them to enjoy the water like other members of the public who do not have disabilities. So I think it's very clear for, for the members of the commission to understand that right out of the gate. I don't know that that was properly stated before, but I also, don't know how aware you all are 
of the process that's ensued to get us before you. It has been literally a three-year odyssey, and it's gone through every level of the government, state, county, city, et cetera, and all their staffs and departments, et cetera. Um, anyone who is interested in looking into the background of project or program open space, uh, have at it. Um, it's, it's very comprehensive. But I would refer to the acquisition application and project agreement that had to be submitted by the city of Annapolis and by CRAB to the department Maryland Department of Natural Resources. And a couple of key points to note is in that application consistent with the Maryland law pertaining to program open space uh, grants. It starts right out by saying in paragraph three of the acquisition application, which turns into the project agreement, by the way, it says right out of the gate, the purpose of this grant request is to acquire uh, 0.8687 acres of land at 7040 Bemby Beach Road in Annapolis to provide an adaptive boating center for people with disabilities. And that is what the whole application and the whole uh, approval uh, process was about. And that's what the agreement is about. I don't know if you all are also aware that prior to the, or part of the submission of the application um, was the city of Annapolis through the planning and zoning director at that time, Dr. Nash, which said um, Annapolis Recreation and Parks Department is applying for funding through project or program rather open space to help support the Annapolis Adaptive Boating Center acquisition proposed CRAB programming. Um, this is a unique uh, opportunity to support an organization whose mission is to enable disabled persons, wounded warriors, and local youth from at-risk neighborhoods to assess the water or access the water through adaptive sailing boats. It further goes on to state that the Department of Planning and Zoning finds that acquisition that the acquisition is consistent with the city of Annapolis 2009 comprehensive plan, the county's, Anne Arundel County's 2009 general development plan, uh, et cetera. And then it winds up by saying the Annapolis Boating Center acquisition proposed craft programming is consistent with the 2004 draft of the Annapolis Recreation and Parks Master Plan. This project will undoubtedly fill some gaps in the recreation and parks environmental programming and inclusive programming objectives. Um, and I would also point out in the uh, application and agreement that in paragraph or section 6G, where the question is, please describe the public access that will be available on the property and note any restrictions or limitations both prior and subsequent to park development. And I think this is very important. And again, I don't know if you all have had the, uh, the time or uh, been given the opportunity to review all this information, but it's all applicable. It says the AABC, that's the Adaptive Boating Center, will be open to all people with disabilities and their families and caregivers during the boating season from April through October. A limited number of members of the general public may serve as volunteers at the center. The general public cannot be safely accommodated during this period, nor is there sufficient parking or dock space for additional vehicles or boats. The safety and accommodation of people with disabilities is the primary objective of the center. The center will open to members of the general public who own boats and desire to have their family or friends with disabilities boarded on a reservation basis at the center dock with the support of crab volunteers using um, center boating, boarding equipment. Members of the general public who desire to visit the center may do so in the off season from November to March when the center programs are not being conducted. And that is all part and parcel 
of the application and the process consistent with Maryland law governing um, program open space grants and the purpose is, is clearly articulated. So the whole purpose of this and part of the agreement with the state which granted the money which came to the city to buy the property included those conditions and what it was about. And that's extremely important for everybody to understand here. So the public does have access to this property whenever it's open, but it's restricted to people with disabilities, et cetera, as stated during what we'll call the boating season as set out, that is part and parcel of the application and the uh, approval. And that approval had to be obtained before any money flowed down to the city to buy the property. So that's in there. The general public may have access as indicated and restricted uh, at other times. So it is open. It's just the way that it's being used because the focus is on people with disabilities, which is consistent with what um, that Dr. Nash said, the city's plans is to create inclusivity. Then I'd like to jump over to the city of Annapolis lease agreement. And again, I, I don't know if the Planning Commission has had an opportunity to receive a copy of the lease and actually review it. Because I've heard a few comments a minute ago when uh, uh, Chairman Sale, you asked uh, your attorney, Mr. Beard, to comment. And what I wrote down here is you mentioned uh, that issue with the city entering into a lease with provisions not that are not according to the code or pursuant to the code. And I would strongly suggest that there's none of that in this lease. And I would highly recommend that people read the lease and fully understand it. Um, the other part of it is, if we go through the lease, and I'm not gonna read the whole darn thing, believe me, but the key provisions of this lease, uh, the whereas clauses cover it, but it's really paragraph one, lease premises, it says that the lessor, which is the city, hereby leases the premises to the lessee. Here's a very critical point in 1B. The lessee shall have the sole access uh, to the premises for the use by all people with disabilities and volunteers and staff working with the lessee consistent with this lease agreement. Then it goes on to say the general public will be provided access to the premises during non-peak boating periods, generally November through March, to learn about the adaptive boating center as further described herein, i.e. in the lease. And the lessee's mission and programs provided by the lessee, CRAB. Due to space limitation, this general public access uh, may be by advance reservation and no other services shall be required by the lessee during access by members of the general public. The lessee may grant temporary license to third parties for the use of any and all of the facilities on the premises in accordance with the purpose of the lease agreement. It goes on to describe some of that. In paragraph three, use of the premises, A, the lessee shall use and occupy the premises for the sole purpose of operating the Annapolis uh, Adaptive Boating Center for boating, sailing, instruction for people with disabilities consistent with this lease agreement. Fundraising activities on the premises shall be used to defray the lessee's operating and capital improvement costs for the premises because of the fact that the operator, if you will, is a nonprofit and is you know, not in the business of generating money uh, except the raising. Um, the other point that I would make in paragraph 3E, it says, and this is very important, the lessee acknowledges and understands that the premises is subject to state of Maryland laws, regulations, and policies relating to POS funding as further specified in a natural resources article of the Maryland Annotated Code. And the lessee shall comply with all POS legal and policy requirements in its use of the premises. Um, it goes on further to say, it talks about the improvements will all be at the sole cost and expense of the lessee 
So I can assure you that we've been in significant fundraising mode uh, to try to raise funds uh, from the, uh, the public, members of the public. And the good news is we're very close to our goal of being able to do this uh, project uh, debt-free because if we can't do that, we can't build it, but we're very close on that. But, um, it, but the whole point of the improvements is for disabled persons at the premises. It then goes on in 5B, paragraph 5B, to talk about the specific articulated repairs and improvements that will be made at the premises, which include, among others, removal of the existing docks and existing commercial building, uh, installation of new floating ADA docks and an ADA fully accessible uh, building uh, further from the shoreline. Uh, next, removal and replacement of the currently existing single family residence to create space for a pavilion for all patrons, collectively the initial improvements. And it does say that the commercial building on the property um, the current building on the property does not meet ADA code, is unsuitable for people with disability, ergo it all has to be torn down um, and something will be rebuilt. And it even refers to an open uh, air pavilion will be constructed, uh, et cetera. So we've got all that. The sole um, person or responsible party for maintenance uh, of the premises is the lessee, which will be crab. Uh, no, no question about that. It's not the city's uh, funds, it's ours. It does talk about in paragraph 16, permits and compliance with laws. So it says the lessee shall be solely responsible for compliance with all applicable laws, okay? Including compliance with all zoning requirements. So the lease does specifically state that we have to meet the code or anything that's, that's built there has to be the city code. And we're also responsible for acquisition of uh, any permits, uh, et cetera. There are default provisions, I would point out, that the uh, tenant lessee would be in default for failing uh, by failure by the lesser to observe or perform any material covenants, conditions, and provisions of this lease agreement, including following and complying with all laws. That includes the city code, okay? Fair to comply with any and all state laws, regulations, and policies related to program open space funding used in connection with the premises. So like it or not, when the city received the funds, uh, to buy the property, which it did, it agreed, and this is incorporated into the terms of the lease, that this property is going to be used for the purpose of a facility to uh, deal with people with disabilities. Um, but there are, as I've already read you, sections that deal with when the general public may have access. So any suggestion, um, or finally the governing law is that of the state of Maryland. So I'd like to point out that any suggestion by anyone that the, the, that the grant of the money from the state of Maryland, uh, which had to go through approval with the county and the city, there was anything wrong with that, it, it's just not accurate, number one. Number two, that the lease, uh, the city took the money, bought the property, entered into the lease as part and parcel of the, um, the um, acquisition application and a project agreement, which was to build out the Crab Adaptive Voting Center facility as stated. And all of that ends up in the lease between the city and Crab, uh, which has the provisions that I indicated to you. But very, very clearly, it does require compliance with the code. Now, the final thing I would like to address, and then I'm gonna ask Mr. Bollinger to, uh, to speak, is there was a reference by council to 212280, which is review criteria and findings. And I would totally agree that this project is subject to those conditions. This is a major site uh, design review, but it's not a use review. It is a major site plan design review. 
And so when you look at the criteria, I'd suggest that all of them, first of all, have been uh, discussed by the planning and zoning director uh, and are included in the staff report and that it was indicated that all of the criteria have been met, uh, number one. But if you take a look at them, 21, 22, 80, it talks about um, number uh, A, district standards. The proposed design plan meets all of the requirements of the zoning district in which it's located. This is the WMI. So it's Waterfront Maritime Industrial. Any suggestion that it's where we are is quote residential and zone residential is simply not accurate. Um, and if you look at where the, the site is located, it is surrounded by a number of other marinas uh, starting coming down the road just before us. You have Jabins, you have Port Annapolis, you have Annapolis Landing, and then on the opposite side of us, you have Annapolis Sailing School. There are a couple of residential properties interspersed among those uh, industrial facilities, but they it is not a residential complex and it's not zoned residential. So we have to be cognizant of that because that's criteria A. Criteria B is design, the proposed design. It's all about design, not use. It's design uh, is in harmony with the character of the surrounding neighborhood and consistent with a comprehensive plan and achieves a maximum compatibility, safety, efficiency, and, and attractiveness. Now, again, the property has been a marina forever. It was a marina, I suggest, before the, those houses uh, that are currently occupied as residents uh, existed. But it's been operated as a marina. It's going to continue to be operated, in effect, as a marina. On the property now is a large maintenance building, which will be removed. On the property now is a large well, a house, which is going to be removed. The only structures that are going to be put back on the property or built, the adaptive boating center is actually uh, shorter in stature than the existing house. It's going to be in approximately the same location. Uh, this adaptive boating center, the building will be actually further away from the water because that's what critical areas commission wanted. So we're complying with that. Um, and the only other structures are going to be a couple of areas that are bathrooms and in a storage locker right by the area where people board the boats and a pavilion um, that really is not that large that will be uh, put there that's even mentioned um, within the um, application and within the lease. Uh, C, compatibility. Each improvement, building and or use is compatible with other uses and with existing and proposed developments on adjacent land. Well, again, if we look around at the other uh, properties, um, every property, be it residential or industrial that's there, has the right to use the property as the, town, as the city code allows. And that's all we're gonna be able to do. Nothing more, nothing less. The requirements dealing with hours of operations, types of operations, um, the noise and all that is all controlled already by the code. And we have to comply with the code. Anyone suggesting that there's something else in the lease is just flat out wrong. D, uh, minimize adverse impact. The proposed structures are cited in order to minimize any adverse impact on a surrounding area, et cetera. And again, we are removing two substantial buildings, only adding back one, which is actually shorter in stat, uh, stature uh, than the building that it's effectively going to replace. The next is building locations. The proposed locations of the buildings, open spaces, landscape, pedestrian vehicular circulation systems are adequate, safe, and efficient. All of this has been reviewed for the last year and a half with the city to come up with a plan that met all the critical area requirements, the city uh, code requirements as to parking, as to landscaping and all the rest of that. And it's, it's all right there. Natural features, minimal uh, modification of existing uh, topographic features, 
there's going to be some grading that's minimal and replacement in order that we can put in the kind of ADA uh, accessible uh, pathways, uh, which we need, just like is the case with the parking lot. And all of that has to be done while at the same time meeting critical area requirements and land coverage requirements. So all of that has gone through uh, it is part of the criteria that's that's effectively uh, you know been approved. Um, slopes and soils minimizes uh, unique like steep slopes. We don't have that here. And finally, critical area. The proposed design minimizes adverse impacts to resources in the critical area overlay. Um, so we feel that um, we agree with the city of Annapolis who stated the position that this project, this site plan does meet all of the criteria. And those are the criteria that you're subject uh, to making decisions by using. We're subject to, the city's subject to, uh, we're all on the same page, I believe uh, with that. So on that long-winded note, but I did wanna point out those technical points as council uh, for um, crab in this particular matter, but we feel we're in total compliance. Uh, the use of the property is going to continue to be effectively a marina, but again, I reiterate that it is for the public. It's just that during times, certain times, it will be restricted to use by citizens with disabilities, and that's the whole purpose of going through the program open space and getting their funding and we are subject to their rules and regulations, just as we are uh, the codes and the laws uh, uh, otherwise. So on that note, um, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Paul Bollinger, who's the executive director of CRAB. Oh, hold, hold, on, hold on a second, hold on a second. We've, that was quite long uh, for the development. Yep. Usually we have these be pretty short for uh, changes to the plan and design. It's not a change. Uh, all right, hold on, time out. Uh, but we do have a lot of people online for the public that need to speak. And right now, the uh, uh, we I would like to for the commissioners. I would like to give the public a chance to speak before it gets too late and we get filibustered out from the public hanging around and make any comments. So, commissioners, do you have any problems with us moving to let the public actually get their words in right now? No, no let's do that. We'll, uh, have, uh, we'll have plenty of time for us to get words in later. So, let's hear from people who are online. That's what I'm thinking. I agree. Diane? I agree. I agree. Dave. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderfully. All right, fantastic. Uh, so let's let's uh, get some uh, fruit from the public here, and we've had some comments. And thank you, Mr. Nolan. You gave me some time to look at uh, some of the public comments as well that were uh, that I didn't get to. So I finally finished all that, uh, and uh, we do have. Uh, I believe it's sorry that they they sent us in the letter. Hopefully, you guys get to read. I don't see them displayed here, but. Uh, Julian, uh, who does the first person public? Let's start with a council member first. How about that? Yeah, you think yeah. that's right? I think Mr. Savage. So you said you wanted to start with me? I think so, because you represent the largest uh, contingent of possible people. So, Or would you like somebody else uh, to start before you if you need some uh, time? Well, I don't mind going after the public. I mean, my remarks are kind of, they're not quite as long as Jim's, I think, but... Um, okay. I tried well, to address a lot of the things that I heard you talk about at the last meeting. So I haven't timed myself, but it's probably, um, I probably have about five to 10 minutes. That's, so that's I, good. I'll do whatever the board wants me to. All right. Uh, well, let's hear from the, uh, the members of the public neighbors first uh, joining the project. Julian. All right, Mr. Chair, we, first we have Amathias. Okay. Uh, great. Thanks so much. Um, so so can you guys and your residence uh, location as well, where you uh, reside? Sure. Okay, so so I live at uh, 7046 Benby Beach Road, um, which is right next to the Crab property to the west um, and sort of to the south also. We sort of surround the property. Um, myself and Peter Sari, who also has comments to make separately than myself, um, have been deeply engaged with this project. And I guess, you know, just to start, I would say that we're utterly supportive of the CRAB mission. Back in the 80s, Peter and I taught sailing together at the Annapolis Sailing School. We've sailed our whole lives. We own a boat now and spent the entire summer, you know, sailing offshore. Um, we love sailing and we love to make sailing more accessible to others. We've talked to Paul uh, Bollinger about volunteering in the future. We have no problem whatsoever with the CRAB mission. 
Um, we do have issues and, you know, I almost wish that Peter could start first because he is actually a land use attorney and he has a kind of more structured way of thinking about what's being proposed at the craft site and how it fits and doesn't fit um, with the um, zoning code, with the WMI um, concept, with the program open space philosophy and program policies um, and all of those things. But I mean, I guess, can, can we switch to Peter or do you, do you wanna start with me? Switch to Peter. Let's go, go ahead, Peter, if he's ready. Yeah, start with Peter and then we'll come back to me for, for, for sure. my- And I'll, I'll display a map of the property in the interim so everybody can see that. Okay, thanks, thanks. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so just kind of wanted to just uh, focus more. Uh, what I'm gonna focus more on is, is really uh, sort of initially the process. Um, so and it's interesting to hear the, the previous project that you were discussing uh, where you had uh, uh, neighborhood meetings, you had, um, you know, uh, traffic studies, all sorts of things. Um, well, that's, that's the thing uh, initially that, that, that is one of the initial issues is that, first of all, I mean, we, you know, we got a notice that was incorrect. Everyone in the neighborhood got a notice that was incorrect. So we hope you're, you're going to send out a correct notice so everybody can participate. Um, but anyway, and, and that's, that's outlined in our, in our uh, comments that we made. But basically after the last meeting on the fourth, uh, we, you know, we looked into this more, we talked to neighbors, we read the lease, we read the memos and various things that were, that were in the docket. And uh, you know, none of our neighbors had any contact with anybody. <laughs> Uh, from the city, from, you know, I guess a couple of people kind of had an idea what Crab was doing. Two neighbors, uh, Wayne Williams and Carl Williams, actually were uh, the owners of the, the, the property that the city bought. They, they thought it was going to be a nice, um, you know, daytime accessible boating facility, which we did too when we bought the property. Um, no one really, you know, has any idea what the the, the actual plan is here because that's all Crab is saying they're going to do. But what we're concerned with is that the lease goes far beyond that. The zoning laws were just changed recently to allow marinas or waterfront maritime industrial properties to expand their use, to put restaurants in, to have events and parties, weddings, things like that. So that, that's what we're concerned about. That's what the neighbors are concerned about. We had a meeting on our property and we invited uh, the Alderman, uh, Alderman Savage this weekend. 20 people showed up, not a one had any, any real concept of what was going on. No, no one had met with anybody in the neighborhood. This is a, res just so you understand, this is a residential neighborhood surrounding the, the crab facility on all sides. Uh, you know, we're, we're 15 feet away from their building. Our, our neighbor on the other side is 15 feet away from their proposed building. Uh, so, and then the other, other neighbors are all within earshot up and down the road. Uh, so, you know, we don't, you know, no, no one, no one I talked to objects to crab coming in and doing the core, the core function, the core mission. I think everybody supports that, but the idea that there are going to be loud potentially events at night for fundraising. And that's specifically contemplated in the lease, specifically contemplated in the zoning code changes that are out for signature by, I suppose, the mayor. I think that's how it works. Um, you know, we, 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 we are concerned that there's gonna be extensive amount of noise in the neighborhood, a fairly, very, very quiet neighborhood. I mean, you can, you can hear a pin drop at night there. Um, and then the amount of traffic that's gonna be coming in the crab facility, I think for their, their core operations, their daytime operations, they probably have it covered. There will be an increase in traffic. There's already a lot of traffic that comes down there um, for the sailing school. There was some traffic for the marina, but it wasn't really that much. Um, but it's a narrow road. There's, it's not very nice road. It's, it's got, you know, it's a narrow road. It's got a curb on one side. It's got people living 
oh, I'd say 20 feet from the road. The houses aren't set back very far. And, you know, I don't want to speak on behalf of everybody who was at the meeting, but, and I don't know if they commented separately, but there was pretty much universal concern that there was going to be a lot of traffic, a lot of um, people parking on in people's yards, a lot of people turning around in driveways, no turnaround at the end of the road. So it's already, it's already pretty bad right now and it's just going to get worse. So, you know, looking at the, uh, the staff report basically said, this is a small Marina and, uh, you know, crab use is going to be less. <laughs> and then on the other hand, it says it's going to be a highly marketed, highly visible facility, you know, highly visited facility. So, you know, that, that's the thing. We really don't, we really don't have a sense of what crabs plans are outside of the core function. And, and that, that's the concern. Uh, you know, we're, we're very nearby. I mean, we're literally 15 feet from our property line. If you look at the plants on two sides from the building, there's going to be a pavilion there. There's going to be open space that, you know, and, and that, that all sounds like a, a, a large wedding event venue. Um, so there's no, there's no sound barriers. There's, there's a, some trees and visual barriers, but nothing really to block the sound. So, um, you know, that, that's from our perspective, that's an issue. I know from our other neighbor on the other, on the other side, um, that's a concern of theirs as well. And then we also have the additional concern of, of really no visual screening, which I think was part of the project uh, from, of the building. So two sides of the building border our property and there's not, there's, virtually no screening. There's a fence, six foot fence, and a few shrubs, and basically an almost 20 foot tall, tall building, which granted there's a house there now, but that's, you know, that, that was the Williams old house, the uh, built in the early around 1900, where they lived. Um, so, you know, it was residential right there. So, so you know, granted it's, it's, it's a waterfront maritime industrial zoned, but we're residential, we're R2, as are um, the Rykowski and Weathers, Weathersby uh, house on the other side. All the other property in that area, other than a small portion between Crab and Annapolis Santa School is all residential. So, uh, you know, it's a residential neighborhood. It's, it's, there's a lot of character of people who live there. They're, they're hardworking, down to earth people. I'm sure Rob can attest to that. Some of them are a little feisty, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we don't want crab to come in to the neighborhood. No, no one there wants crab to come into the neighborhood and be a, be a, a, a bad neighbor. Um, you know, we don't want to be bad neighbors to crab. We, we welcome crab to, to the neighborhood, but uh, it just doesn't seem like the, the facility has, you know, the, the plan has been fully thought through. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, Can you tell and, me what year uh, your house was built? Our house was built in 1950. Okay. And the other houses in the area, I know were built in 1970, I believe. So they've been there a long time. And we, we, like, we like the mar marine industry. We, we kind of looked forward to being near a marina on one side and being near crab on the other side. But when we found out that this is potentially gonna be a, you know, really a party venue wedding, you know, you know, that, that type of activity, I mean, that we, we really object to that. And we, we, know, we don't begrudge crab having their own fundraisers for their own, you know, donors and people. Like, that, that's fine. We understand and we expect that. But the idea that it's going to turn into that, basically an event site on the waterfront, you know, very attractive, uh, beautiful view. Um, you know, that, that's really our concern. The amount of traffic and the influx of people coming into the neighborhood is... Uh, also a large concern. Uh, so, you know, we hope that at least some traffic studies would be done, at least some consideration to sound buffering would be done and the visual buffering as well. Um, I think those will all be appropriate and it doesn't look like those are... Oh, and, and then also um, Alderman Savage suggested um, at some point he would uh, inquire if the planning commission would want to have a meeting with with some of the neighbors, a few of the neighbors, those maybe most impacted. And we're very open to that idea. Um, we're also open from the previous meeting, the November 4th meeting, uh, open to the idea of giving some of our land over for uh, conservation easement 
um, you know, to help Crab with their, their planting plans, but we, we haven't heard anything back on that. So I did speak with Mr. Bollinger about that and kind of showed him where I was thinking there would be space. Um, but again, nothing, nothing has come back to us on that. So, yeah, we, you know, we, of course we welcome Crab to the neighborhood and we think it's a great idea and it's, a, you know, hopefully it's going to work well for everybody, but, uh, you know, we're, we're concerned. So, all right. I'll Thank you very that. much. Uh -huh. And the, the, uh, are, are you done? Pretty sure you're done. Yeah, I'm okay. done. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, stay on the line, please, in case commissioners have questions for you before we Absolutely. transition to the next public uh, commenter. Yeah, I think Ann wanted to speak more if she could. Okay, we'll let Ann go. But commissioners first, you have questions of Mr. Uh, Peter? Okay, we'll move on to Ann then, if that's okay. Let's move sure. On to okay, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, sure can. Okay, um, so, you know, I... I <laughs> It's just so hard to have this conversation because we do really believe in and support Crab's mission. And so the heartfelt nature of our commentary has nothing to do with disliking what Crab has as a vision. It's more about the use and the noise and the time and the traffic. And I would just point out that uh, there is a lot of interpretation, particularly of the lease. I mean, Mr. Nolan is an attorney. He went through the lease. He talked about the public access, but there really is no public access, even if you are a disabled person. You have to join a CRAB program. CRAB completely controls access to the site. For example, Wayne Williams is a disabled person. He grew up in the house that we live in, which was owned by, which was built for Eleanor Bemby Williams. Eleanor Bemby, grew up in the house that Crab intends to demolish. That Is house, that the house I'm pointing at right now? Uh, no, the, the house on the Crab site, a little bit to the left, to the left, that, the one that they're gonna demolish to build their 2,600 square foot conference facility. That house was built in the late 1800s by Franz Bemby, the, the owner of all the land on that point. It was the first house built on that point. It's a historically significant house. So Eleanor Bemby grew up there. Um, at, at some point. And in 1950, her father built her the house that we now own, which is right next door to the left, the more white roof to the left. That's our house. So the whole area is steeped in Bambi family history. So Wayne Williams, who grew up in the house that we now own, lives just to the south. It's that light brown roof just to the south off Bambi Beach Road. And his brother, Carl, lives right next door in that other light brown roof down where it says Google. Yeah, right there. Um, if you just a little bit to the left, to the little reddish roof where it says above the water, right, right there, that's lived in by um, a family that actually is like cousins of the Bambis and, and actually lived in the Bambi house for a period of time in the 70s. Literally everybody is related in some way or another. So it's a tight knit community. And, and all of them are watermen. All of us are sailors and watermen of one sort of the other. But you know, the idea that on the one hand, you, you might say, oh, this is a public facility for people with disabilities, but at the same time, we're giving sole and complete access to Crab, who at the end of the day can shut the door and go home with the key in the pocket, is just, it's, it's different than what most of the neighbors envision. Um, I also would point out that there was a waterfront access commission that was um, uh, created by the city of Annapolis, and they could not recommend um, exclusive facility for CRAB. Um, they were disbanded shortly after the decision was made. Then also something I shared um, later as a public comment, uh, something from the Anne Arundel Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee, um, encouraging Anne Arundel County to reconsider and to do a, a more in-depth um, a, a site review and use study to try to determine if they could create a more open and more public facility or perhaps even go to a different site. So it's not that this has been rubber stamped from the beginning uh, by everybody. It's just been <laughs> rubber stamped by a couple of really influential people. Um, and I think it's really important. Peter mentioned that and I'll, I'll stop because I know there are other people who want to speak. But in your prior commentary about the synagogue that's being 
plan for nearby off Forest Drive, you talked a lot about how public access and public comment and public participation in the process was so important. Well, the, the notice, the statutorily required notice that was mailed to all of the nearby neighbors alerting them of the November 4th hearing was defective. The link provided to watch the hearing in real time was incorrect and didn't function. Um, you know, even P Peter and myself couldn't find a way to just stream it and watch it. We, we only found it because um, Tom or the, the, uh, the other person who supports you all invited us to the Zoom portion of the call. So it was a defective public notice. It was effectively not a public hearing. So, you know, we would encourage you to redo that hearing or redo another hearing so you have the appropriate public hearings where the neighbors have the opportunity to really participate. Um, so I'll stop there. I know there are others. I hope, I hope some of the other neighbors are on. Um, I know that Rob can share, uh, Savage can share some of the perspective that he heard from our neighborhood meeting. Um, okay. Are you aware if the I'll link is working thanks. tonight for your friends in the neighborhood? Pardon me? Are you aware if the link is working tonight for your neighbors and friends in the neighborhood? Because you had a special invitation for tonight, so. Yeah, I haven't tried it. The The link did not work last time. It was um, that it was- Can just you try it while we hear from you? Can you go and try it while we hear from the alderman? Yep, and the I'll try. Yep. Appreciate it. And we'll hear back from you when you can. Okay, thanks. All right, next on the uh, public testimony, Julian. Uh, I should share there is one other person here, but it looks like they have left. So that is all. <laughs> Rats. And who was that person? Do you know? Uh, Mr. Guy Schaefer. Mr. Guy Schaefer. Hey, Anna, do you know who Guy Schaefer was? Or Peter? Are you on still, Peter? Yeah, I'm still on. I, no, I don't know who that is. is it may, maybe that was that uh, for the applicant? Mr. Bollinger, you, you said raised your hand. Did you know who that was? You know, Admiral Guy Schaefer is on the board at Baywoods, and I believe was going to be speaking for the Baywoods Homeowners Association. Okay. Uh, if you, if by chance you have his number, you contact and tell him to come back. It'd be appreciated, Mr. Bollinger. Thank you for that. Really, he's Thanks. he's ninety five years old, so it, we will do our best. Uh, that was ageist, right there. Come on, he could still be going. <laughs> he. Well, he can right. kick most people. I'm not arguing that. I'm just saying maybe that. <laughs> okay. um, hey, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is Jim Nolan. Um, uh, hold on, hold on. Jim, hold on. Jim, Jim sorry, just real quick. On uh, Admiral Schaefer, um, I have his number. He's a Baywoods residence. Uh, I'm going to give that number. Julian, I'm going to give the, his number to you because I just called and he said he's having some difficulty. Uh, technological difficulty, but he does want to testify. Yeah, right. Rob, do you just want to text it to me real quick? Text it to you? Yeah. Yeah, I'll text it to you. And if I could have him phone it in, give him the information to phone it in. And Mr. Savage, I think you'd be next on public testimony then. If yeah, you got and we, al we also did receive Mr. Schaefer's public comments today, his written ones, just so you know. I don't know if, can you all still hear me? I just, yes, I, I can see meeting on the Annapolis Boards and Commission's YouTube channel. However, I just would remind you that this meeting was not shared as a mailing to the neighbors. The yeah. continuance. Yeah, it was yeah. a continuance, so it was not shared. So they don't really have any idea how to even watch it in real time. So do we have any confirmation from the city that the link was defective? I mean, you guys reached out to Tom. And Tom, do you have a, can you confirm that the Link David, was not I, David, I can chime in here. I mean, the, it's the same link on every agenda that just takes everyone right to the Annapolis board. No, it was, mis it was misspelled. It was misspelled. It said it. New tub. I believe that there was correspondence with Cynthia with Miss Sari about about the link, and I I believe there was a a typographical error in the link, and that was the reason that it was not yeah. usable. And That's I think she, it was referred to the Office of Law. From the Office of Law, it's very hard for someone to argue notice when they're on the call. The note, the, the typo included the discussion of YouTube. To the extent the public doesn't know that YouTube was incorrectly spelt and can find the City of Annapolis website to go locate YouTube, 
then I think that they should lodge any complaints that they may have. But I do believe that the notice is sufficient in to the extent that the people who are complaining about notice are on the call. But it's but it's up to us if we want to continue it for another week for the public hearing. Okay. And we can decide the that commission later. is within its rights to do anything the commission decides. Okay, thank you. Let's go ahead and hear from uh, Alderman Savage then. Think that'd be efficient? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so thank, thank you, folks, for the opportunity. Oh, they're ready for you to testify on the hearing now. Mr. Bollinger, could you mute, please? Or Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, sorry, sorry. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, so, um, uh, Julian, can you take down the... Oh, shoot, my... Um, iPad's about to die. So if I die, I'll reconnect. But um, so just to, real quick on the public notice uh, comments, um, I do want to make it clear that we have had multiple city council meetings and public hearings on the most recent resolution, but also on uh, the legislation way back from a couple budgets ago when we authorized this uh, via a special amendment. It's also been in the newspaper a number of times on this topic. Um, we have had, uh, uh, I've had multiple town hall meetings where this was discussed both in person and virtually. And in some instances I did physically fire neighborhoods. Uh, put, I've put posts on social media and my biweekly newsletter email to folks. And that's not to mention the stuff that Planet Zoning has done as far as physical site notice, which has been up for a long time. The crab sign itself, which has been up, the mailed notices, newspaper notice, et cetera. So, uh, we've had ample notification for this uh, project. It's been many, many years in the making. Uh, to, so to say this has been rubber stamped uh, is uh, it's, it's not only an exaggeration, it's rather insulting to the effort that a lot of people put into this. Um, but I want to jump into a number of things that I listened to the last planning commission meeting and I heard a number of things that were, I think you, you wanted to ask of me. Um, so I know um, one of the questions had to do with uh, plantings and mitigation. And uh, I think on the mitigation for the critical area is the bottom line for that is that they are, um, they're, they're planting, proposing to plant more plants and trees than currently exist. So this is beyond no net loss. This is the net increase of tree canopy and vegetation, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and as far as the offsite mitigation, I think this, that should be looked at. Um, but space is very limited in the city. And if, if the Sari uh, Mathias residents are open, I think that's certainly win-win because they do have a large property with a lot of uh, open space that could fit some trees. The only catch is this might uh, be a problem if in the future that property's uh, bought by somebody who wants to put maritime industry on that property. So that's the only catch. Um, another issue that was mentioned was sediment control. And uh, yes, I've been heavily involved with this issue and there are some, some things that the, the applicant, I think, could do to go above and beyond. And I'm sure the city will look at that, but they haven't quite gotten to their stormwater uh, grading permit review process yet. That's when it typically happens. Uh, and to clarify, reinforced sill fence, which has a welded wire with T-metal T stakes, now that's the minimum in Annapolis. Um, so, and I know they've talked about having double rows of sill fence. And one of the other thing they could do is put up super silt fence, which is a silt fence back to the chain link and uh, the round metal posts. That's the strongest silt fence out there that I can put up. Um, and so, but, but also, you know, I just, uh, as was mentioned, I, I did attend, um, you know, my, my, one of my main attentions with speaking tonight is just to kind of relay some of the, the comments and sentiments that I've heard from constituents over the years. And uh, um, as was mentioned, I did meet with about one to two dozen of the residents this past weekend uh, and for a discussion about, you know, just listening to them about their concerns and trying to give them some information. Uh, and some of the, their concerns were, ba were based on bad information, but others were, I think, completely legitimate concerns. Uh, the primary two concerns had to do with traffic and noise. And on traffic, I think it's clear that no one in this Bemidji Beach community wants increased traffic impacts. Uh, and while shifting from, I think shifting from a marina to the, the uh, boating facility, 
uh, it's, it's no change in use. And I don't think it's going to lead to increased traffic impacts. Um, and I think those that arise, that arise could be properly managed. Um, but I know one of the big concerns that was mentioned was parking on the street. And, I, and as I said to the residents, that's currently illegal. They can't do that. So call the police. Uh, but one thing I think the city could do to help address that would be to put up some no parking signs to make sure it's pretty clear that they can't um, park um, on that street. Um, but it's also clear the residents don't want additional pedestrian traffic. Uh, and that's partly due to impacts on their property and peace and quiet, but also due to security concerns. Uh, and if the planning commission is now talking about trying to open up this property to the general public via some kind of limited pedestrian public access trail, I think this is a concern to both their security and their traffic concerns. Um, and on a related note to the traffic, you know, I was previously pushing for a sidewalk improvement on Edgewood, oh, well, this is where Edgewood Road turns into Bemba Beach Road, but pushing for sidewalk improvement in front of this project on Bemba Beach Road um, and all the way to, way to the sailing school. But uh, after speaking with the residents at this meeting, I've decided to, to completely back away from that. Uh, they clearly don't want sidewalks. Uh, they don't want any kind of road improvements down there um, because they feel that's gonna encourage additional traffic, be it vehicular, um, particularly over here, vehicular traffic, uh, but also pedestrian. Um, but they raised a good point where th there's really no um, destination, public destination. You know, the sailing school is private and the proposed crab facility uh, is really going to primarily be for the disabled folks um, via reservation. So it's not like people are going to be walking to this facility. Um, and the other issue they brought, well, their other major issue, has, which has been mentioned, is noise. And uh, I don't necessarily have a great answer to this, um, but I will say this is something we can work out as, as neighbors um, by ensuring that our existing noise ordinance laws are adhered to. Uh, I had to deal with this in my neighborhood where we have a school directly adjacent to it. And the school unfortunately had a lot of speakers pointed right towards the community and they had some very loud air conditioning units and they worked with us to address those concerns and, and get those issues mitigated. Um, but I think limiting use on this property for special events based on what's ultimately an unsubstantiated fear, a fear based not on what Crab says, and Crab says, you know, events maybe twice a month. Um, so to put these, to put some kind of restrictions on the property and not apply to the other maritime properties, I'm not quite sure that's the best way to do it. Um, and just speaking as, as a council, as an alderman, I think it'd be best addressed on a policy level uh, by the council if we want to uh, change some of the uh, noise -ish, um, requirements in the WMI, the Maritime Industrial Zone uh, District. Um, uh, but I, I think to put restrictions before this is even an issue especially on a property that has a stage that's only what, 20 by 10 feet or so, I think was mentioned at the last meeting, small stage. Uh, it seems like it's a bit premature to, to put some restrictions on it. Um, and I will say that the nearby Maritime Museum has received zero complaints. And this is what they told me about their noise from their events. Uh, just as I've heard zero complaints about concerts from across the water on the other Maritime Museum property in Eastport, which the residents actually said was louder um, than the uh, sailing school. But I also have not heard any complaints regarding the sailing school events who, who do, they do have weddings and various things down there, except for uh, traffic complaints, which again, we've tried to address. And I think the school has been very proactive and responsive to trying to address those. Uh, the other big issue uh, was public water access. And, um, uh, and believe me, I, I really do appreciate this, the commission's comments about public access. You know, the fact that we are having these conversations means that we've come really quite far uh, in our efforts to increase that. And so uh, and this is really, I think, largely due to the efforts of yourselves in pushing these important issues. So I really do sincerely thank you for that. Um, but, you know, I think as Mr. Nolan kind of alluded to, uh, when I listened to the last meeting and I heard comments that the project isn't open to the public and needs to include public access. And I think those statements are a bit of a mischaracterization of what's happening here and really misses the, the forest for the trees. Um, this project is by its nature all about creating greater public access to the water. Uh, in this case, it's for a subset of a population, about 20% that have 
historically been discriminated against. And they continue to be discriminated against. Um, and I say this because nearly all of our public parks don't have any kind of uh, full ADA access or features for them when it comes to that water access. And this project would set out to correct that historic injustice. Uh, and, and in Ward 7 here, you're talking about probably greater than 20% of our population. You know, we now have four, soon five uh, senior complexes on the Edgewood Road corridor. Bay Woods, Annapolis Gardens, uh, Bay Forest Senior Apartments, Bay, Bay Village Assisted Living, and, and soon the Bay Village Independent Living. And these seniors make up a significant portion of our residents. Um, so when you're talking about putting a path on the property for increased public water ac access, um, well, what about the access for these residents for that 20%? Um, because the general public, the able-bodied public can access any of our parks or street and parks. Uh, this isn't the case for the disabled. They have really zero access. Uh, I mean, Truxton Park has some um, facilities there, but they, I don't believe they have all the lifts and equipment uh, and especially not the boats that this facility will. Um, so how are those street and parks or, or Maury Park or City Dock truly public access if they're discriminating against 20% of our populace? It isn't, and they aren't. Um, but by creating this facility, uh, primarily for that 20%, that corrects the scenario and corrects the historic injustice. And you know, tonight over dinner, I was actually talking to my wife about this and she had a very astute observation. Uh, she pointed out that we have, for example, buses that are dedicated to the elderly and some dedicated to ADA, um, but we're not telling them they have to include at least one seat on the bus for the able-bodied public. And that's kind of what it's like with this facility to put a path on the property uh, when, again, the public already has access, plenty of access in this area. Um, or following an example mentioned, who, who already have entire buses dedicated to them. So I hope you can understand why in this situation, I think many of my constituents, especially those in, in Bay Woods who have been vocal on this um, and beyond though, are, are getting concerned about um, the discussion and about the idea of adding public access for the able-bodied on, on, uh, on the very first facility we have for the disabled. Uh, and especially in light of the fact that right down the road, probably a quarter mile or so is, is the Moyer Park that has full facilities for the able-bodied. Um, so I, I just, you know, I think, so why would we put that, put at risk the very mission and purpose of the craft facility and risk increasing the security and traffic concerns of the neighborhood uh, simply for what amounts to essentially a token public water access trail that's not really needed. Uh, and that is why it's best, in my opinion, to keep this as a registration-based system as described in the lease and by DNR. Um, and I'd ask you to protect the access for these residents for the 20 percenters. Uh, and I'd ask you to push forward with uh, correcting this historic and current inequity and injustices people face when it comes to an inability to access a beautiful Chesapeake Bay. Um, so that's all I have for my prepared comments for you. I'll also entertain any questions or clarifications. Thank you, Mr. Savage. Could you point out the public access? If you live in that neighborhood, where would you go? Uh, and I will move the cursor to where you're talking. On the screen. Yeah, if you just move the map to the south a little bit. It's right there at the Maritime Museum Park Campus. So they have uh, multiple points of access. That's where um, Capital SUP operates their business out of. Um, so they do have small boat launch. They actually, the city, I'm not sure if we still do it, but we do have a boat share program that's run out of the actual dock on the other side of that park. Um, so that's, that's the nearest point of public access. Is there any other public access on the point at all that you know of? No, but there really aren't many residences down there. Uh, there are those few houses, but otherwise you have Bay Woods to the east. Uh, but Bay Woods is actually closer to uh, the Maritime Museum Park. And, and I know they've, for a fact, walked over there for their events. Um, so I, that's another thing I'm, I'm trying to point out is I don't know. There, doesn't, there isn't really a huge need to have the general able-bodied public have access down there because there are only a few houses and, and they're within walking distance to the park. But looking at the area for development in the future, I mean, we have uh, projects are, that were talked about over here. Uh, we, that's still not up on this property. Uh, they're going to increase in the future. And looking at the future, 
Uh, and look at what we have on the other side of Back Creek. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a ton of access over there for the public. Um, and look in the future, you would think you'd, you'd want to have some more access if you could have it in the area. And you really only have one location where it would be nice to add another for the future. So well, you, you're mindset. not. And that was the mindset of what we're thinking in our last meeting. Uh, so what's your argument with that? I've heard your argument, which is good. Well, well, the, the, with this part of the uh, peninsula there where your cursor is, um, that property right there is uh, WMI. Uh, the area right around the house is carved out. I, I don't call if it's a grandfather residential, but that small area with a cottage is carved out for residential. But the entire open space is, is proposed to be WMI. Um, and so it's not going to be residential homes. And that forest to the south of your cursor is currently just a handful of single family homes. Uh, Bay Woods actually owns a chunk of that forest right below your cursor that's owned by Bay Woods and conservation easement. And then south of Bay Woods there where it says Annapolis boat shows on the right there, that's Chesapeake Grove uh, development project that's proposed. And that, although I can't recall if they've been to you for a work session, but I yeah. know that the, the staff is already including uh, limited public access on that property. And that's going to be, and so that I think makes sense. But, but again, I think down the peninsula, we're not going to be having a huge uh, residential um, development. Okay. Uh, that, that's a good point. Um, can I ask staff, do you recall if in the design, the public access there, because we actually did talk, uh, we had a work session uh, and actually in the meeting. So, Staff, can you recall if there's going to be public access over here? Yes, Mr. Chairman, there is public access included there. Um, they're actually talking about dedicating that whole beachfront area to the city of Annapolis. Fantastic. And I'm, I, it's been a while since we heard on that one. I would, it, I would say a year ago uh, plus. We were in the, actually in the chamber, so that'd be two years ago, I think. Okay, so all right, let's talk about it. Uh, commissioners, we're, we're, we're here in the case from Alderman Savage of access, or, or before we, uh, and Julian, if you got the other person Julian, on, yeah. I'd like to go to that other person before we start talking to Mr. Savage and going into depth on conversation. Uh, still no one else on yet. No one else on? Well, then it's a great time to talk to Mr. S Ms. Pendel Charles just popped up. Are you gonna have something to say on this? Do you wanna? Yes, I do. Uh, Thank you well, so much. We'll go. Well, would you rather us talk I, before we ask uh, or talk, to Mr. Savage, about the in depth on waterfront access? I guess Rhonda, it would be good to hear from you and your concerns, and then we'll hit all of you at the same time after that from the commissioners. Sound sound logical? Okay, sounds logical. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and my camera keeps going out. I don't know what's going on on my end of it, so I might keep going in and out. But anyway, good evening. I'm here to support the Crab Adaptive Boating Center. It is my understanding that the commission is seeking to make the Crab Adaptive Boating Center, ABC, for the public year round. It has been explained to me that crab sailing programs, as well as their limited parking, do not, where am I? Do not allow for the general public to just drop by on the property or on the docks. Crab has been very supportive of our city's youth, especially our youth underserved communities. For example, currently as the school community liaison specialist for Anne Arundel County Public Schools, in January 2020, I asked and Crab without hesitation, readily agreed to adopt our nearby Georgetown East Elementary School, agreeing to support our students in their core courses and combining that with skills obtained on the water as CRAB moved through this process. The city's program open space grant agreement with DNR specifically limits public access to the adaptive boat from November until March on a reservation basis. Since CRAB will be hosting programs year round in the ABC building, it is imperative that CRAB is aware when the general public may wish to visit so that CRAB can ensure parking or no conflicts with non-sailing programs. In addition, it is my understanding that the commission is seeking a path on the property for the general public to walk to the water any time of the year. The path would be built in a flood zone and require the removal of plantings on the property. Apparently CRAB is already 4,400 square feet short of the required planning 
by the critical area commission. Invariably, this will exacerbate the plan and cost Crab even more money for the fee in lieu of planning. However, but please take note of what Alderman Savage has indicated as it, as it relates to plantings and tree canopy. As with the crabs in general, everyone is very excited about the arrival of this crab. Thank you very much. Um, so Ben, I have one thing to say. Um, I have one thing. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't, so I think Rhonda Pindell Charles has been misinformed. Um, we have, not, the, the intention of the commission was never to open it up to the public or to put a path in. We're just asking questions at this point. We're asking if that's feasible. But that's never that's not our intention. And that's so, so that's mischaracterized. But I appreciate your what you're saying here. But just so you're clear, we don't we haven't we don't have any intentions to do anything right now, except see okay. everything. I, I say it was my understanding. So okay, I appreciate that. Thank sure. you, Mr. Ives. Sure. All right. Thank you, Ms. Rhonda Pindell Charles. Uh, commissioners, questions of the. Uh, public testimony providers, uh, questions for yeah, I, I have a couple of questions for Alderman Savage. Questions for Savage. Uh, you know, that, that relate to the, the sediment things that I brought up last time. Um, so I, Cynthia sent around some, uh, in, in her, in her write-up uh, answering some of those questions that talked about the additional measures. And the question I have for you Alderman Savage is, is, do you think that is that sufficient? You know, if you if this were any other uh, development along the water and not something and not this one, would would you be satisfied with what was stated there? Um, it was under in, in her uh, in her email to us uh, number two sediment erosion control wording to be added as a condition. Are you satisfied with that? Have you seen uh, that? I'm sorry, I haven't seen that. Uh, so we, we can send it to you or, or I could, or I could read it if you, if you'd like, it's one paragraph. Um, yeah, if you, if you're, uh, willing to read it, that'd be great. Sure. It's, it, it says, uh, it, this was recommended by, uh, Matthew Waters from the city staff du due to the location of the project and the extent of the work to be done, this project will need to install additional erosion and sediment control measures to prevent sediment from leaving the site. A turbidity curtain is required along the shoreline adjacent to the site. Since there is a storm drain with an inlet on Benby Beach Road, inlet protection will be required at the inlet and turbidity, a turbidity curtain will be installed around the outfall of storm drain system. All of these additional measures will need to be monitored and maintained by the contractor through the duration of the project's construction. So is that is, would that be satisfactory to you based on your um, your experience with with these um, you know certainly it's been in the news lately so I, you know I wanted to make sure that because uh, this is not my wheelhouse so I, I wanted to make sure that's gonna work for you and you know if this were if this were a development someplace else would would that be enough or would you want more I appreciate the question. Um, thank you. This, as you said, this has been a big issue elsewhere in the ward. Um, I think that's good. I mean, part of the problem is the city just hasn't done, I don't think they've done a complete review yet of the stormwater or sediment control plan because they don't do that until they look at the grading permit, at least in, in too much depth. But, but in terms of what, what Mr. Waters said, I think that's a great idea is to put a turbidity curtain up you know, they, they did that um, as long as it's installed correctly uh, and maintained, it'll, it'll, it's designed to catch water. It's kind of your last backup. If, if the fence fails on site, it's going to wash into the turbidity curtain. And then after the project, they have to clean it out properly. But um, yeah, the only other thing I mentioned, which would be um, for the city to look at putting uh, double rows of silt fence or um, requiring super silt fence along the water. Um, but um, you know, it, it's really going to come down to also just um, which contractor they get they hire to do the work, and and um, you know, hopefully they'll have somebody on on the property who's monitoring this. Well, so, so part of the uh, part of my motivation for for uh, for zooming in on this is that 
in, in this, I think will come out later on when we have our deliberations perhaps is, uh, you know, this is city property and we're supposed to be setting the tone for what we want people to do uh, as, as private as private developers. And, you know, I, I mean, I, we, we have to set the right tone and, and set the right example and not say, do as I say, not as I do. And so I brought up the idea of, you know, since this is uh, essentially a city owned property, we, sh we should go above and beyond because in so many other examples of, uh, of projects we talk about, and I think I've even heard you say this, is that we need to go above and beyond. And, you know, people push back on that and say, I'm doing what the code says, and they stop there. This is an example where we, we, can, we can lead. And so I, I just want to make sure that, so what I asked is last time is, is for staff to research that, to come up with a condition that we can actually put in our recommendations. So it has to get done. This says we're going above and beyond. And, that, yeah. and that's, that's really what I'm zooming in on here. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a great, great thing to do um, for sure. And this is a good time to do it. Um, and I think, and it does make me think of something I, I think I forgot to say regarding their planting, which uh, I think you, you mentioned the planting a little bit, um, is that uh, you know, they, are, they are having to result to the fee in lieu, but part of the problem is the critical area laws don't take into consideration, uh, the mitigation laws in particular don't take into consideration all the permanent pavers that they're putting on the property. You know, they get zero credit for permanent pavers, uh, but it also doesn't take into consideration some of the envi other environmental um, things that they're putting on the property, be it the electric vehicle charging chargers or the uh, solar roof, uh, solar panels on the roof, um, which again are good things, which we want to obviously encourage. Um, but but our laws just—I know we recently updated critical area, but we weren't quite aware of all these issues. Where I think it might be good to work in some of these other ways to, to kind of get credits on the property, especially in this case where they're increasing the overall amount of vegetation is let's, let's um, maybe, maybe use some of that to address some of the uh, other stormwater issues on the property with pavers. Okay, thanks for that. And the other, other question I had about plantings, and I, I don't know if this is gonna get talked about, not, but I looked over the, the changes to the planting plan and again, I'm not a landscape architect. So it, it, what it looks like to me is just uh, a, a bunch of things were removed. And I'm just curious if there's some rationale for that. It just for somebody to, I don't know if the landscape architect is on, but so, somebody that could could just sort of walk us through why why that, you know, what, what prompted that change. I'd be happy to answer that question. Okay, sure. I asked the same question of our landscape architect and he was informed that the uh, amount of shrubs, bushes and perennials are specifically limited by the critical area commission and only 30% of the property could be with shrubs, 20% with bushes, and 10% with perennials. That's why there was the reduction. Believe me, we do not want the reduction. We, we have designed the property to be extensively planted up. It will far exceed anything that ever existed on that piece of property. And uh, that is our intention. Okay, great. I, I, mean, I, I figured there had to be, uh, for, there had to be a, a probably a simple answer there because it, the the changes were really specific. Um, so anyway, thank you for that. Uh, and I guess this is a question. To, speaking about traffic, perhaps for for Mr. Bollinger, if if you were to have. Um, and, you know, some events say, you know, whenever you, somebody comes to you and says, hey, I want to have a wedding here. So you have a wedding. And so, so what happens if they invite more people than it fills up your parking lot? You know, just walk me through what you're going to do about that. Well, it's something we 
really haven't thought about as we mentioned uh we're so focused on getting the building permits and the uh, construction done but looking well out into 2023 you're probably putting into any contract that you would sign with a third party having an event the limitation on the amount of vehicles that would be allowed which uh, we only have 23 spaces uh, we would probably refer them to the sailing school at the end of the gravel road if they needed additional spaces and maybe the sailing school could make some money out of that parking as well but uh, as Alderman Savage said, there is no parking on Bemby Beach Road. And right. uh, as far as our guests are concerned, no one is getting their, out of their vehicle and stepping onto the grass or the lawn. It's not yeah. happening. Yeah, no, I understood. I, that, no, no questions about that. I was just, you know, sort of getting in, zooming into this idea of, you know, these other event space uses that, maybe a peripheral to crab, but I, I, I think your, uh, your comment about limiting number of vehicles in a contract is right on the money. So thank you for that. Thank you. I, I have a couple of questions. This is Diane. I was curious about the lease. Um, there's no mention of underserved youth, wounded warriors or seniors. And um, it's, you know, it's something that's been mentioned several times and I think a great benefit to those underserved groups. So could the lease be uh, amended or have a condition that includes those particular communities? Because I know it's been part of your programming before and, and probably will be in the future. Um, I think Rob uh, Savage would have to respond to any amendment of the lease or perhaps the city's uh, legal counsel. As far as CRAB is concerned, those are our constituencies and we will be serving all of them regardless if they are listed in the lease or not. So maybe um, Chris, if Chris Beard is still on the phone, is there a way to include that as a condition just so that, I mean, not that the executive director would go away and there'd be another owner or management or another board that could then exclude all these um, subgroups of people and say, well, here, here's the lease. The lease says solely people with disabilities. You know, obviously things like that happen, but we're just, we want to just make sure that the intention is spelled out. It's not quite spelled out clearly in the lease. It says solely people with disabilities and staff and volunteers. So if there's a way to clarify that in a condition, that would be really great. May I make one quick comment on that? Sure, uh, I'd love your input. Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, you referenced wounded warriors. Well, I would diplomatically suggest that wounded warriors are in fact individuals with disabilities for starters so they would call sometimes it. not so i um i do sailing with different groups of uh people including um we have something called sailing heels and people with um cancer and then we have the wounded warriors um and we do it out of another club but they're not technically people with disabilities that could hang a disability um hanger from their you know rearview mirror and be able to well, park in a disabled parking but, lot. So but that it's a technical is, so, distinction, but maybe not one that's important. Um, I, I would concur with that. But I think I think what is very important is to look back on the fact that CRAB has been in existence for 30 years. And the groups that you're speaking about are the groups that CRAB has served. And I can tell you that that is in our mission. Um, whatever's in the lease is in the lease. I, and certainly I was not involved with preparation of the lease, but I I just, as a practical matter, I don't think this is really an issue. Well, I would respectfully disagree just because we can't always assume that um, the wonderful staff that's there now will always be there. And if they want to enforce the lease, they can cut out a whole subgroup of people. I'm not saying it's likely. I'm just saying just make a condition and just include those subgroups and it would be, um, it would, it would be something 
that would help enforce it if it ever became a problem, which if, again, if I, city, I envision it wouldn't, this, but. As counsel for a uh, crab, if the city wants to amend the lease, I don't think in that narrow regard, I don't think that would be a problem from our end. Okay. Great, thanks. Just so you know. David Iams, uh, anything? We're all going. Mr. Chair, if I can just jump into, um, I believe I'm Mr. Schaefer here now too. Just so you're right. Oh, you do? Yeah. Okay. Let's hear from him. And Mr. Schaefer, could you please uh, state your address? He's calling by phone. I think Mr. Schaefer, I believe if you hit star six or star nine. Star six the, should be it. Star, star six. six. Thank you, man. Or can we unmute him? I can only ask him to unmute. Which not is he that number down there on the right, 6609? I believe so, yeah. And you can't unmute him? No. Mr. Schaefer, you're uh, muted at the moment. And uh, Julian, if you can't unmute him, then who could? Jeez. <laughs> I used to be able to, but then they changed things on us. What's what's the what's the key press you have to put in, Julian? It's a star six. Star six. Oh, if you guys would continue, I'll see if I can get him unmuted here. You know, it'd work is if he just calls uh, Alderman Savage and Alderman Savage puts him on speakerphone. Or Mr. Bollinger, yeah. Bollinger, yeah. Let's go with Savage. His system's more clear. True. Ms. Pendel Charles, while we're at it, go ahead with your question. With your question. I I just like to um, reiterate. I just like to reiterate what what Ms. Butler, Commissioner Butler, indicated. I like adding that release. I think it it shows that the that, that the uh, city is hard and inclusive of uh, residents, and so I think that's something we should do. Braithwaite's call since he's out I'll legal but just to put my two cents in. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pendel Charles and Diane. Uh, I you... have pressed star oh. six. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, we can. Yeah, Go yeah. ahead, sir. The, the floor is yours, sir. Great. You. Great. Wonderful. Great. <laughs> now, uh, with respond to the Wounded Warrior effort, wounded warrior. Uh, this is an effort that Crab has been supporting until the Kodemic uh, problem. And it has been attended at the Secretary of Defense level. Uh, one of his principal assistants has been pre one of, it could have been an Army officer or it could have been a Navy officer. There are no Air Force in the area that can, can handle this. But they are, the Department of Defense is very, very, very supportive of this. I have been involved in it since it got started. And I can assure you that there is a senior, either male or female individual from the office of the Def Department of Defense that at attends and speaks at these at these crab sailing opportunities, it is given a great deal of attention by the Department of Defense, and it's all positive. Is that all you have, Mr. Sheriff? Hello. Is that all yes. you have? Well, thank you. Well, the other the other the other point that is of interest to me is that this issue. <clears throat> My research into this particular effort is somewhat interesting in that the individual who is seeking the change in zoning failed to do his due diligence when he bought the, uh, the, the home, and he did not take the time to find out that that home was zoned for residential. The rest of the area on Bedley Beach Road is zoned for maritime industrial. And that is what Baywoods would like to see it because that permits 
crabs to be involved and it, it involves Baywoods being involved with crab and the fact that the individual failed to do due diligence when he bought property is not a responsibility that that crab or Baywoods or any of the other industrial activities such as the Annapolis Maritime Museum and uh, that's not their responsibility to do the due diligence for the individual who failed to know that it was what his property was zoned for at the time he bought it. And I, I, I find it somewhat interesting that he is now asking to put a number of activities, including Annapolis Maritime Museum, CRAB, uh, the effort that the city is working with the Department of Interior on getting uh, the, the uh, property that is south of Baywood as part of a uh, introduction to the Chesapeake Bay uh, and some $3 million has been identified toward that effort and it is now being, all of this is being held up and disrupted by an individual who failed to do due diligence when he bought some property. I find it somewhat interesting that there's, all of this effort is being spent uh, a lot of people's time and a lot of people's effort on somebody who is now belatedly trying to recover uh, from a mistake he made over a year ago. Okay, uh, the mayor of Annapolis spoke to the residents of Baywoods in uh, no, early November and uh, in October, and he was a strong supporter of what Crab was going to do. And uh, I, I find it very interesting that one man who fa or a woman who failed to do due diligence and find out how his property was zoned is now disrupting a very committed effort on the part of over 200 residents at Baywoods, all who vote, and uh, CRAB and a number of other activities, including the Ward 7 Alderman. And I, I, I am a member of the Baywoods Residents Association Board of Directors, and I have the charter to speak for Baywoods Residents Association. And it is, we are very, very much shocked that all of this time is being wasted on somebody who didn't do their job right when they did it, when they bought the property. Ben, you're muted. Is, is, uh, you were better off with me muted, I guess. Hello, did I come through? You, you did. Thank you very much, Mr. Schaefer. Uh, appreciate you dialing in and going through all that work to get connected. Uh, some good work there. So, okay. Uh, on to um, you, uh, the commissioners. And we, we have some doubling up of the uh, noise there. So if you're not talking, please go ahead and mute yourself uh, so we don't happen to hear your speakers coming through from your uh, computer back through your microphone and onto our meeting. Uh, so all those not speaking, please mute yourself. Okay, coming back to the uh, commissioners, I believe David Iams, you were gonna be next, or I can go, your choice. Sure, um, I, I'm not sure that somebody didn't do their due diligence um, because I think the property owner was in R2. It's just, he happens to be surrounded by people in WMI. And so I'm not 100% sure what that means exactly. Um, I do have concerns. I, I don't have the really concerns about the public access as much because as, as was pointed out by um, Alderman Savage, there are other areas right nearby that you can go to. The Moyer Park is very nice. It's right there. Um, there aren't a lot of residents down in that area. So I don't really think it affects. And for us to carve out a space for very little people, we have to look at it in the context of where it is. I think our intention is that we'd like to make as much public access as possible, but I'm not sure that it's really as necessary in that area. I am concerned about how, you know, with the adverse effects of having, um, of having events, especially weddings, can be towards neighbors who are in the R2 zoning. And, you know, there, I read the, um, the notice um, with regards to what the intentions were with regards to how many, I guess it's, there was a letter um, in the public comments about what the intentions were um, with regards to public access. And I appreciate those, but they really don't mean a lot because it's really up to the board of directors and future people where that goes. 
And I do understand Mr. Savage saying that, hey, you know, let's deal with that when it happens. We have a huge issue with this city with regards to enforcement, especially with noise complaints. And I don't even think they have decibel uh, meters in the city that they're using. So I really have a concern on that of how this is going to affect the neighbors just with regards to this. I get concerns when they say we only have 23 parking spaces. I mean, I, maybe I misunderstood, but is there a way that people can park on the grass later and will they do that even though they're not supposed to later on? Is there a grassy area? I'm assuming there's not, but I just wanna make sure of that. I just wanna double check on that. Um, 23 parking spaces, I think it's, it, it really precludes how big an event can be. So maybe it's not as much of an issue as I thought it would be. Those are my thoughts right now. And again, you know, this whole use thing may be out of our purview anyway, so we'll go from there. Okay, uh, thank you, Dave. Um, with regard Dave, to- Dave, just, can I, can I make just a clarification on the zoning? And, and, I, and I went and looked at the zoning map. Okay, uh, go right ahead. The, the, the property uh, just south of the Crab property is actually in the WMI, but it, it you know, as Ms. Goudin is, uh, Clarified that it's it's a conforming residential use within uh, within the WMI. So, okay. So it's yeah. I appreciate that. Just I think the woman who who had um, Mr. Sari and um, I forget her name. She she had said it was R two. So that's where I was. Well, the property is just on the other side of R two. I mean, I, I actually I, I have the zoning map pulled up. No, I'm you, talking you about the, it, the but... home where the 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 neighbors are. They R two or they? Those are R two. Yeah. That's what I, yeah, that's what I was so saying. So it's, it's, what, it, was it's the lots just south of Sari's property that, that are, are two. Yeah, and I understand that, I understand that Crab is in WMI. I absolutely understand okay. that. I was concerned about that the residents, you know, that they, they bought an R2. And I don't think that they ever said that they, that they didn't know what their property, what theirs was. What their, I think it was kind of stated that they bought something and they were trying to change the zoning on where they lived is what I, is what the, I heard from Mr. Schaefer, but I'm not sure that that's true. So thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Dave. Uh, and Mr. S uh, Peter, sorry, I believe wanted to make, raise their hand and give a comment so, for quite some time. So Peter, can we hear from you? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I just wanted to rebut uh, just a couple of things that Alderman Savage has said about other venues and um, particularly the sailing school the annapolis maritime museum across back creek and uh any other event uh, venues um i mean first of all there are no houses as close to those properties as we are i mean we are like i said 15 feet away on the other side the other residential property is 15 feet away and then there are houses all around there so uh, the sailing school does have a wedding venue and they have, there's a house right next to it, but that's owned by the people who own the sailing school. So, <laughs> uh, you know, if they have a problem with noise, then, then they can deal with it. Uh, um, so the other comment I had is that if, if there are, you know, a limited number of events that, that crab is planning to hold the third party events we're talking about where the, you know, the weddings and the like, um, you know, and it's, and it's limited, then I would say build that into their um, their use of the property. And if they need to expand beyond that because they don't have enough money or something like that, then bring it up later and let's see how it goes. But I would, I would approach it from the other direction to say, you know, limit their use now and then expand it later. And that, that ties into the enforcement issue as well, because, um, you know, I've, I've lived places in the past where enforcement was just a nightmare i lived across from a, a public i mean a private swimming pool and in my neighborhood and just was a source of endless friction in the community so you know we're trying to avoid that up front and i think the commission could do a lot in that regard to keep it you know limited from the start and then if it's fine if there's no problems no complaints then expand later that's the approach i would take so that's all i have to say Hey, Peter and uh, Rhonda, one more time, real quick, please, so we can uh, run it up. Real quick, Mr. Imes mentioned that about the decibels. I'm the public safety chair for the council, but I can check with the uh, police department to see if they have that mechanism, and I'll get back with you. I really appreciate it. I know we had some issues downtown 
with regards to the Annapolis Summer Garden Theater and a lot of things that weren't being enforced down in the market house area. So I thought there was no decibel meters, but I appreciate it. Sure, not a problem. Mr. Sale, when it's appropriate. Hold on, Mr. Nolan. No, no, we got we got to get to uh, uh, Dave. Uh, any any further questions? Okay. Um, for uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought there real quick. Uh, Tom Smith, I got a question for you regarding zoning and what's currently allowed, and under the WMI uh, proposed changes by our little subcommission group, what will be allowed. So Tom Smith, right now, uh, the Port Williams Marina, as it is, uh, before it was purchased by the city of Annapolis, could they uh, have, in that zoning, could they have uh, weddings there if they wanted to on their property? Could they have parties on, if they wanted to on their property? Honestly, Mr. Sale, I'd have to research that a little bit. Um, I. It was zoned WMI as of three years zone ago. WMI, right? which is an industrial zone. Um, I honestly, I've never had that. Um, What's the Maritime Museum it, zone? It's uh, no, that's 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 a, a a WMM or WME zone on that side, not mm -hmm. not a WMI zone. I did want to make one correction, if I may. I, I, I still think that that um, Mr. Imes wasn't informed in this aerial you have up, oh, you just zoomed out, that uh, 7046 and 7030 Bemby Beach Road, uh, both of those structures are zoned WMI. They are not zoned R2. Okay. Just, just for clarification purposes. Yeah, the house in between though, what is, that's the one that's being torn down, right? That's the one that's being removed for crab. Yes, sir. Okay, so so the resident who said they were R2 was not R2 is what you're saying. That's correct. Okay. And was that changed any time recently, Tom? No, that's what I said. No, no, sir, it's been that way since since I recall for 30 years. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, very important points there. So WMI. I, I, don't, I don't know houses. if I'm uh, could I just make one quick zoning comment? It's something I'm extremely oh, is that? Is that Anna? with. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt. But You're all out. Go ahead. Okay. I'm so, I'm sorry, Mr. Sale, but our property is specifically noted as deemed conforming. Our residential use as an R2 property is deemed conforming in the WMI district because we existed when the district was created. It's right there in the zoning code. So for all intents and purposes, we're an R2 property. We have all the rights and restrictions that an R2 property has. And until we abandon that use and turn it into something else or sell it to someone who turned it into something else, it's deemed conforming as a residential use subject to Annapolis city code R2 zoning rules, period. So that's what it is. Like we can't build a gigantic non-conforming R2 structure there. We're, we're bound as an R2 residential use by the R2 zoning code. And we have all the rights that an R2 zoned house would have. So that's the zoning uh, treatment of our property, just to completely be utterly clear. Thank you very the, much. The zoning Anna. overlay was added later. Thank you. And, Mr. Uh, Hale, at some point, I would like Mr. to interrupt. Mr. Also. Nolan, can you, uh, uh, until you're called, you can't, you can't speak. We have to have some. Well, everybody else is interrupting, but. No, because okay. I'm allowing it and I'm not allowing you. So, Mr. Nolan, thank uh, you very much. We need to get through this. And it'll be thank to your benefit you. if you let it flow, probably. So, uh, Mr. Mr. Smith, do you have a, a regards to that comment or our own I legal Mr. Just, Beard? Just one addition to what was stated, and yes, it is a deemed conforming use, the single family residence, because they have been there as they are in other maritime zones, but the new ordinance actually just further restricted what can be done um, on the, can be left there, cannot be relocated, and cannot be expanded beyond the existing footprint, as long as it meets the R2 setbacks. Just wanted to Thank add- Thank you, Tom. I was gonna- I was just looking for that because that yes. was added. 
It's so October while 25th. the new ordinance added sort of, I guess, liberalized, if you, for lack of a better word, some of the WMI uses that actually put further restrictions on deemed conforming uses. Exactly. Hey, Tom, Tom, while you're still there, can I ask a quick question? Yes, ma'am. So this may be um, something that Cynthia could answer. I know that you're filling in for her, but um, a resident at 7033 Benby Beach Road had uh, raised concerns about uh, speeding. And I know Alderman Savage mentioned that people were concerned about having more cars down there. Did anyone um, consider uh, providing speed bumps? I don't know how much it costs to, to add speed bumps, but, but is that a, a simple solution to some of those concerns? Uh, Ms. Butler, um, Commissioner Butler, excuse me. Uh, I'm not sure our public works department's a fan of speed bumps or speed humps. Okay. Um, but it's really a question to, to, to re relay to them. I know we have done, as we have done in Eastport uh, on Bay Ridge Avenue, we've added some traffic calming devices, um, such as pooch outs and whatnot. I think public works prefers those over um, speed bumps or speed humps. Uh, yeah, I was just curious whether it was considered at all. Okay, um, Right. Thank you, Diane. Any other questions, Diane? Uh, well, I did have one It had to do with the conservation easement. I think it was um, one of the planning commissioners in the meeting I missed last week. Um, the idea came up about helping solve some of the tree mitigation plan by potentially planting on the property of the, uh, I guess, Anna Mathias and Peter, um, sorry. And I thought it was a great idea. I just wondered, it sounded to me like nothing had actually come of that, but is it still being pursued? Because it sort of helps everyone to have the tree where you'd like it to be away from the water's edge where it might not do as uh, well. Diane, I, I distinctly remember, and it was also written in the uh, comment section from uh, Peter uh, and, and I believe Anna as well, that they uh, have not come to an agreement or right. what got any work done with them. So uh, uh, yeah. But so does that mean it's a dead deal or is it something that, um, yeah, so in, in, in the city's mind, is it a dead, is it, a, is it no longer a, an option? Um, and I guess also Mr. Bollinger, you could respond to that. Is, are you working that or has that not been worked? I've uh, walked the property with uh, Peter Sari and saw where he wants us to uh, plant or he was willing to give an easement. Uh, in essence, it's blocking the Williams property from his view, which I can understand given what you see behind there. Um, but what it does not mitigate is the planning that we're going to have to do anyway. So it's not one in, in uh, lieu of the other. Uh, we are going to uh, either plant on city property, pay a fee in lieu of planting, uh, or we have the option of uh, planting on uh, sorry Matthias property if they grant an easement to the city so it's it's not something that is worked out or decided by crab I would assume they have to give the easement to the city first before anyone's willing to plant on that property okay Tom what do you think about that as far as flow for who has to give what first I think Mr. Bollinger stated it, it correctly. I mean, this doesn't substitute one for the other. That they have, you know, right now committed to paying a, a fee in lieu for what mitigation doesn't fit on site. But if they can find a location off site, such as the easement that Ms. Commissioner Butler, excuse me, mentioned, I think that's a great opportunity. I think the code leads you to planning on site and then off site and at the last form a fee in lieu. So if we can find a property uh, off site to put into conservation easement, that'd be excellent. Okay, and as the design stands, there's gonna be a tree at the water line uh, between the properties that uh, Peter and I believe Anna do not, would rather not have. And if we don't condition that in now, I don't know what the odds are that happening, but that would be something that uh, those two would have to work out anyway. And as it stands, the, the applicant is not required to change the design to accommodate their view shed, I don't believe, because it, the prop planning would be on their property. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, if I may, right. and Mr. Bollinger, jump in. I believe that 
what I heard Ms. Gudinius relayed to me was that they did revise their planting plan and adjusted the species of trees along that property line. They, they removed the large oak tree and I believe substituted a bald cypress and removed uh, some of the dogwoods and added some hollies for some additional screening in, in that area at the request of the adjacent property owner. But Mr. Bollinger, please correct me if I don't have that 100% right. Mr. Smith, uh, that is exactly correct. Okay. Uh, Diane, you have any other questions with regards to that? No, not at this time. Thank you. All right. So if, uh, if the property owner wants to work that issue with the planning and zoning department and, uh, Mr. and the applicant, I believe that would be the appropriate process. For us to put a condition for them to do that, I think is, is kind of out of our bailiwick. Uh, any other uh, comments with regard to that from the commissioners? All right, I'll go into my other questions. Uh, and I'm going to ask for Mr. Savage here to talk with me. You know, the, 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 one, the we have some big issues that we had uh, all been talking about, and it's the noise being one. We'll get to that in a little bit for me. And then the other one was the uh, thought of public access, whether it should be uh, put as a condition to put on the property. And we've heard good arguments both ways. Now back to um, Alderman Savage. We talked earlier about uh, where the public could already go. They could already go down here to the Annapolis Maritime Museum Park campus. And there will also be part of the design that we talked about right here at this beach and Tom uh, mentioned earlier, there will be public access over here. So we have fantastic amount of public access to the South on this peninsula. Uh, other than that, there isn't uh, much up here other than the fact of the argument made by the applicant earlier that at, in fact, this the Crab Marina is designed uh, primarily for public access and for uh, handicapped people, people with uh, disabilities to get into the water. And in the off season, when the very cold months, November to March, when I, I know for a fact, I, I, I don't like to go down the water too much, but it would be more open to the general public to utilize. Uh, we have uh, talked amongst ourselves about getting uh, some kind of like small path to the water because uh, we're requiring that on other properties and starting to within the city from private developers. Uh, so for us not to do it on our own city property that we've acquired on the waterfront seems to not be setting a good example or maybe setting a precedent to where other developers could then state that, well, due to our own you know, on our, our site application in the future, you know, we have safety issues and other concerns. We don't want to do public access as well. But I, I think that would probably fall on deaf ears uh, when you relate the two projects, one being for the disabled versus another project, which isn't necessarily for that. So good arguments from both sides. Now, Alderman Savage, uh, is there any other uh, waterfront access on that peninsula I'm not mentioning or I'm missing right here? Uh, no, I, th I think that's that's it um there are a couple of private communities who have access a number of them down there that are not open um uh S there's some trails behind the spca but they're not official um access um but i think that's it but i mean i think the other question since you have that or point to make while you have this up is that um you know there there's again on the whole peninsula there's no ada accessible access. Um, and I, I understand that's our property and it's a good point that, you know, we should be doing what we, but, you know, making sure everybody has access, but I think look at the entire city, you know, City Dock, Truxton Park, even Back Creek here, all our pocket parks in Eastport, the pocket parks in um, um, Ward 1, they don't have any, any ADA access. And so um, it's kind of like the city, instead of spending the money to put it on all these other facilities we're kind of focusing on this one particular facility uh to um um increase that access um so that that's i think an important consideration that um for your deliberations here okay well, I, mean, I got that uh, it's just uh you know it, i didn't i didn't think when we had mentioned our last meeting about maybe requesting or seeing if it was feasible to put a small pathway to the water and maybe a bench, uh, that it would be such a uproar of no's going against that, especially when it's city property, it's us and we're talking about something on the side that 
we would gladly, I would think as a commission, give you all kinds of uh, breaks and benefits to your design and help you monetarily or whatever we had to do to make that happen <clears throat> just for something so small. Uh, but it seems that uh, Alderman Savage and many others don't want that. Um, and I get it. So uh, uh, understood. Uh, as far as uh, going to the, and we'll still talk about that more with some conditions that Bob Waldman had wanted us to table as, as a commission, but going to the other issue I had, and I'll zoom in for the, uh, for noise mitigation. Uh, and the, it's been made as a comparison to across the creek, the Maritime Museum, which uh, operates a, uh, a wonderful uh, venue. And I've, I've been on, I've managed a boat over here for two years in Horn Point Harbor, right next to the Maritime Museum. And the Maritime Museum is uh, a lease property, which has many venues to support its cause. Uh, it's many uh, weddings and things I've seen there, especially during the warm months, all the time, every weekend. And I would hope I would actually hope and support down at the crab facility. If I am a handicapped person, disabled, what have you, let's say I'm in a wheelchair and I live on the Eastern shore or I live in Baltimore. When I'm getting married, you better believe I would want to go to the crab facility and get married on a sailboat and be able to do that as a disabled person, no matter who I am. And, and I would actually encourage that. Now, how do we make that happen and make that possible without agitating neighbors and, and making things go awry around. And if you're gonna have a wedding and I was a disabled person, I'm definitely gonna to wanna to have music. I'm gonna have all my friends there. 23 parking spaces isn't gonna be enough for all of my disabled friends to come in with their vehicles and that don't, you know, it, it, I'm gonna have more than that. So yes, we could, you know, contract out to an Apple Sailing School for parking, whether that's allowed or not, I believe it would be. Uh, other places would gladly uh, maybe work with them, hopefully. So I'm a supporter of those events. But at the same time, I'm very supportive of the neighbors having a valid argument of, you know, we live right here and we're worried about these things. But you know what, there is code, there is uh, times that things can happen, how late and how loud they are, and complaints can be made, things can end. And I'm pretty much thinking that a wedding or a reception is going to die down by a reasonable hour and that can be set up with the crab uh, operations within the city. And I would hope that's being done, that would be done. At, and I, this is my question for Tom Smith right now. WMI and what we know from the commission coming forward it, and the, the crab project, not even looking at the lease, just the way it's zoned right now, whoever would rent out this property, lease it from the city, can you have, without it even being stated in the lease, can you have a, uh, outdoor function like a wedding with a band there on the property as zoned. Mr. Chairman, I'm looking at the code while you asked that question earlier, and it, it talks about under maritime institutions, you can have maritime museums and aquariums, maritime service organizations, and certainly those organizations could have functions. Uh, I'm not sure that wedding function fits into that category, but they could certainly do fundraising functions, as I think Crab had mentioned. And, and so we don't, we don't say you can't have it, right? Correct. You can't have it currently, yes. We don't say you can't have it. So therefore, if you, if we're not saying you can't have it, but we're not saying you can. I guess you could put it under the hat of it's a liable thing to keep the, the uh, program going. Uh, it's a wedding for disabil disabled persons and the money goes to promoting the project and it's a nonprofit, so they need the money. Um, and in the, in, the, in, the new, in the new legislation, in loud. WMI, it says you can have events, yes. specifically weddings, uh, no more than three, three, day, three consecutive days. That's, that's the only limitation that's placed on it. That, and that's, that's in so the new, that was added in the new leg legislation. Thank you, Alex. Uh, that, that goes right, right into uh, where I was going to go. Is it, It's going to be allowed. So it's kind of already allowed, and it's going to be allowed. And I, and I mean, I, I, I sympathize with the neighbors, but I also think it can be handled in a logical way. And I would trust that the city would manage that, and it's, it's going to be allowed. I mean, it's almost like you see in the map, the classic squeezing out of the old residences and the waterfront getting developed and... You know, as a resident, you probably feel like, you know what, they don't care about me. You know, they're just going to do whatever they're going to do. And I get the cause. And, and, and I'm, 
I'm, I constantly, let's not waste any more time tonight about how righteous the cause is. We get it. The cause is righteous. We get it. But how do we do this as well as take care of the people surrounding in the area? And as far as noise mitigation, from the current design that I see, there is plantings, there's some fencing, but I don't think it goes far enough on the property boundaries to take care of the neighbors. And if we modify the plan slightly to, to put in a little bit more noise mitigation measures around the property boundaries to the west and the south, I think you have a better solution that's going to be more appropriate and accepted by your neighbors. And I think it's a right way to go. And uh, it is addressed, I believe, in Mr. Waldman's uh, suggested uh, conditions to the plan. And finally, there is the item of community feedback uh, and a feeling that the community has has uh, not been heard. There's some residents that have talked to us here in front of the commission that say they haven't been heard and hadn't had a chance. But yet, Mr. Savage says they have had a chance and this has been on the table for quite some time. Um, so as a commission, do we give the residents one more chance to make comment and come back or do we just proceed as is? So as commissioners right now, I, I'm done with my comments there and I'd like to show you the conditions that Bob Waldman has uh, put forth and we can debate those and talk about other items. Uh, so, and Mr. Savage, I will give you a rebuttal since I mentioned you about a million times. Well, I was, I'm not looking to, to rebut anything, but just to clarify, um, it, it, for some of the other comments regarding, one of the comments was on speed bumps. And um, I have looked at that on a couple of different city roads and whoever said is absolutely right. I think it was Mr. Smith. The city does, Public Works does not like those. Um, but that again is one of the reasons why I backed away from my, you can ask a, a older woman, Pintal Char, she knows I was pushing to get improvements on this road, but I backed away from it because I understood what the residents are saying in terms of that, that could potentially invite more traffic and potential headaches for them. Um, the other comment um, would be on, uh, again, just overall, I do appreciate the commission's advocacy for public access, but I, I do want to point out though, you know, you've advocated for, on, for public access on Chesapeake Grove, on South Annapolis Yacht Center on, um, um, and then on um, a couple other projects, I believe. But I need to point out that those, that public access you've advocated for was not for ADA, okay? Your access was not for ADA. And so I think that's why some people are getting frustrated now that we actually have a project for ADA, you're coming in and advocating for public access for the um, uh, able-bodied individuals, right? Um, so if you're going to be advocating for ADA, I think in the future, make sure you're, it's, I think it'd be good to be done in a way that's equitable. Um, the, the other comment on which I think to your point about um, noise, I can't remember if I, I mentioned this, but I am completely willing to, if this proves to be an issue on this property or any of the properties in WMI and all the WMI is in Ward 7, I'm completely happy to introduce legislation to adjust the limitations on us on events in the WMI and that will overrule any kind of lease agreement we have the the code trumps everything in that sense um, so I'm happy to revisit that if it proves to be a problem but I think as was mentioned by yourself this is a very small stage um, and I don't think crabs planning any kind of ragers that are going to that, that are going to be any louder than some of the ones we already have coming from individual homes um, so I mean hopefully that helps to well, for some clarification. Razors, I like that was awesome. Thank you, Mr. Savage. Uh, Ms. Pindell Charles. Yes, thank you, uh, Chairman Sale. Uh, I wanna bring up the point about the speed bumps and speed humps that Commissioner Butler brought up. And as I said before, I'm the uh, chair of the Public Safety Committee for the council. So I work closely also with the fire department. There are two reasons. Number one, um, their uh, speed humps and speed bumps uh, damage our fire uh, apparatus and our fire uh, engines and our fire equipment and our paramedic equipment. But also um, we have a class one fire department, which I think there are only about 200 of them in the entire country of all the fire departments, thousands that we have. And a class one uh, comes with a lot of um, perks. One of them is that it uh, lowers our insurance rates. So if we have to slow down because of speed bumps and speed humps, that slows our response time and could affect 
our class one classification for that. Anecdotally, from what I've been told, people tend to slow down for speed bumps and speed humps, but then speed up to make up the time once they go across. So I thought I'd just bring that to your attention. Thank you. Thanks for that information. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. We tried to get some speed humps decade plus ago and uh, the Homewood Germantown area and it came to the conclusion of you really want to be in a uh, ambulance that's got to go over two or three speed bumps to get out of your neighborhood. <laughs> it kind of was like, oh, yeah, gotcha. So, okay. Um, uh, to the commissioners, uh, we still have the public comment uh, time open. And do we feel that we've heard ample public comment to close it? Or do we want to keep this open till the next meeting, give them one more chance to uh, make comment before we review conditions in uh, vote for approval denial. What do you feel, commissioners? Well, I, I have a, along the, those lines, whether a question whether there, there is anybody else that would, um, would testify. I mean, I, I, it seems to me all of the interested parties we've heard from at least a couple of times. I, it seems to me everybody's had, had ample opportunity to to weigh in at this point. I don't know, what do you guys think about that? I'm not 100% convinced of that just because of you know, the issue with you know the link and some people just don't look at the link and realize that it's YouTube spelled wrong. Um, but the fact is the second meeting's not really advertised when the first one is. So I'm not 100% saying that everybody who needed to speak really was given that opportunity or really <clears throat> easily given that opportunity. I'm sure they could have found their way in if they needed to, they knew what was happening. Well, so. and I feel like somewhere between both of you, I feel like there may be people that didn't get a chance to voice their concerns, but I feel like the people that did voice concerns really hit on just about everything you could touch upon for concerns that the public would right. articulate. So if maybe we didn't hear from everyone, I bet you we heard every concern. And at this point, I, I mean, true. if you held it open one more, you know, one more meeting, uh, how is that really going to be any different? It's not going to get re-advertised. Um, you know, may, maybe some additional word of mouth uh, might happen. Uh, but I, I would have expected that to happen between the last meeting, and this meeting, given that some people said we couldn't get in. And it seems to me all of the word of mouth would, would have happened to come into this meeting. All right, um, uh, thank you, Diane sense. and Alex, uh, especially Diane. I think you put it well. Um, I, I believe that ample public uh, comment time has been had. Uh, I believe that yes, there's going to be people out there who don't th agree with me, but uh, we do have to move things uh, along in a logical manner. We've heard a lot of concerns. Uh, yeah, would there be more concerns heard? I don't, I don't know, but. Um, I would like to proceed and close the public session uh, for comment right now, proceed into deliberations by the uh, commission to look at conditions and what we think on the project. So I am going to move uh, that we close the public uh, session, moving to deliberations. And if we, uh, if commissioners, you feel later, we need to reopen that public uh, comments uh, session, you can always make an argument and, and bring it up for a motion, we can reopen it. So. Uh, the time for public comment is been Mr. down. Mr. Sale, I, I'm sorry. Quick second, hold on. quick second. I got uh, Peter Sarr raising his hand on, but we're closing that. Uh, and well, I have an opportunity to uh, say just a couple of things. Like, hold on a quick second. So we're going to close the uh, public uh, comment section session and move into deliberations. But uh, Mr. Nolan has been uh, diligent and waiting after all these other uh, comments back and forth. And I'll give you a quick uh, three minutes, if you don't mind. Because it is nine. Sure. If you wait much longer, you can cause us to just go to another meeting. And you trust will. me, I'm, I totally agree on that. And and I do agree with uh, Ms. Butler that I think we we heard just about everything and possibly here it doesn't need to be uh, reiterated. Um, uh, just a couple of quick things though on the issue of the sediment control, uh, we want to be good stewards of the land too, and so anything that's reasonable and realistic. And above and beyond, it's reasonable and realistic. We're certainly happy to do. I, I would point out something that Alderman Savage referred to, 
is that we, we are <coughs> doing uh, significant solar panels on our building, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of uh, very environmentally conscious uh, things at the property. So good for us. The other, the other thing though, that I just need to point out as counsel for my client is that what is being considered here, and I, I do have some concerns about getting into the weeds on use of the property issues at this point, but I, I would say uh, just there's one point of clarification for Mr. for Tom Smith. I believe when you were asked the question about Annapolis Maritime Museum, is it WMI? I believe the answer is it's their location on the Bemby Beach Road side of the Eastport area is WMI, whereas the property that's over on the other shore is is not as a point of clarification but the only other thing i need to point out is the slippery slope when you're talking about trying to restrict legal uses uh on the property that that uh, we're talking about today where crabs the deaf voting center will be located and i'm talking about legal uses trying to restrict those yet at the same time not so restricting the same legal uses at other surrounding properties, I think creates a very dangerous legal situation. And maybe your counsel can comment on that, but I just needed to reference that, that I think that that is a very troubling uh, uh, way to look at this. Uh, and I, I, I wanted to address that with you right now. So, uh, there, there we have it. And I just note that with our neighbor's property, immediately on the opposite side is Annapolis Landing uh, Marina, which ostensibly can do what the code allows to be done. Uh, whereas if you try to limit us, I think that creates a real legal dilemma. So with that in mind, uh, we greatly appreciate everybody's time and effort. Uh, enough said. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Nolan. Uh, okay. Mr. Chair, if uh, if I may be heard, uh, this is Joel Brapey from the Office of Law. The Festival of Lawyership right now. Go ahead, Joel. Uh, Mr. Nolan raises a constitutional issue. The First Amendment would potentially prohibit, um, first, the ability to uh, limit the, the freedom of association. When we think about uh, events that people may have on their public properties, I doubt that the city of Annapolis can pass a law forbidding people from having Thanksgiving dinners. I doubt that the city of Annapolis can pass a law preventing people from having Christmas dinners. I doubt the city of Annapolis can pass a law preventing anyone from having any specific type of event, such as a wedding, which does come with certain constitutional protections. So I join Mr. Nolan in his concern that in the, the attempt to restrict any events, and I also note that the Maryland Constitution prevents the city from creating what's called, uh, I'll call it ex post facto laws, and that while that applies to criminal situations, the essence is to the extent an, uh, an agreement has been made, the city cannot make a law theoretically that will infringe upon an agreement that has already been agreed and I think that that's a concern for the Office of Law as we think about how we process things going forward. And um, in, in, in light of Mr. Nolan's remarks, I'll just like to um, offer that our ability to restrict events must be rationally related to a compelling government interest. And to the extent the government interest is not compelling, then um, it is void, not necessarily void, but it is uh, constitutionally infirmed to the extent we can't point to a compelling public safety issue, for example, to prohibit one event over the other, because public safety probably would give us the ability to do certain things. So with that in mind, uh, the, the Office of Law didn't render an opinion earlier on because there were no facts upon which we can base an opinion having heard the totality of the testimony and Mr. Nolan's comments, I would be inclined to agree with Mr. Nolan that it's a very slippery constitutional, constitutional slope that we are on. 
um, when we attempt to limit the uh, enjoyment of a private entity's enjoyment of their land. Thank you very much, Mr. Braithwaite. And whoever's whispering, uh, keep in mind that uh, your speaker is on. Um, let's, uh, and your mic is on. Uh, okay, uh, the public testimony has been closed. Uh, and I need, I gotta be honest with you, I need a three minute recess to use the restroom. Anyone else? Cause it's been so long and listening to these conversations. So give me, th everybody take a three minute recess, take a break and we'll come back and commissioners will be now debating uh, conditions and the project as we've heard it. Thank you everyone. I'm back at 10:01 uh, ish. We are now we are now in recess for three or four minutes. Julian, if you wanted to break to a commercial, you could show the video. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's probably the best way for everyone to be here for that.
All right, commissioners, let me know when you come back on. Mr. Chairman, I know time is tight. We have a, a two minute, 20 second video we'd like to show you if you'd like something uh, enjoyable to see before you go. No, no I've had enough enjoyment. Uh, thank you for this evening. So, okay. no, we are. All right, uh, from now on, uh, commissioners only in our legal counsel and uh, Julian, or, or unless you're called upon, are going to be speaking. So, and uh, if we have to, commissioners, you can. Uh, you can call back on somebody to answer a question from the applicant, please. So we'd like to get through sufficiently. But uh, uh, as I see it, there's some things we can probably iron out uh, right now. And I'm going to display uh, Bob Waldman's uh, Word document. I hope it's his. Yes, there it is. Let's get this going. Get rid of the map. All right, so commissioners, we're back on. We'll go ahead, I'll go ahead and call this meeting back to order. So, so the planning commission meeting is back in order from our recess. I'll share the screen for the other commissioners for from Bob Waldman's, uh, he typed these up earlier. And there's, a way I, there's some things we may be able to get out quickly and easy. There's the issue of uh, public access on the property, whether we need to make a condition for that or not. And the feelings, I've had a, from the commissioners and hearing what you've been saying is kind of mixed on that. Do you think, uh, commissioners, that we actually need to make a condition for uh, access on the property for waterfront access? And I'll go ahead and start off with uh, there is the concern of like with SAYC and some others and way we're going in the future. If we don't do it on our own property uh, that we're leasing out, then how could somebody else not use that as a precedent to not do it in the future for their own property when they are developing it and use the same arguments of safety and other things like that. And I've made it known earlier that I think that might fall upon deaf ears because the comparisons are apples and oranges when you're talking about what we're doing here versus what they might be doing in the future. Um, so me personally, uh, yes, I'd like to have waterfront access for the community, but in this project, do I think it's worth the pain and the hassle from uh, the, and what we're hearing uh, from the community, what we're hearing from the, the that area of representation, uh, that there's access already there, a lot of access for the able-bodied. So, and there will be during the winter time, although that's sincerely not preferable to go down. To the, if you're going to want to go to the water, you're probably not going to want to do it during the winter. But, you know, it will be open to the general public from November to March uh, at, with some certain restrictions. I understand that. So there is access to just not 24, not 24 seven by some park bench, which a lot of people would want in the future. So I, I actually am thinking uh, maybe we don't have to have that waterfront access, but it, it can be a condition if we'd like to put it in. Commissioners, what do you think? I, I agree that, that it has to do with context, um, Ben, and where we are. And, you know, this is barely in the city to begin with, but it's not like it's oh, downtown. It's, it's <laughs> Yes, it's right on the edge. It's barely in the city. But, um, you know, I, I agree with you. I agree with you on that. Um, it's not like it's one of these ones that are really downtown and really part in the in the in the middle of Annapolis. Let's like SAYC and some other places are especially. But um, and I do think the Moyer Park is right there and there aren't a lot of residents that live there that are going to use it, that it's not worth a whole big path just for a few people that are going to go down that way. To, to go into there. Um, so I do agree with you on that on that aspect. Yeah, I'd like to add that, I mean, in light of the fact that we're right, that people have access to Ellen Moyer Park and uh, Georgetown Grove may end up being, you know, there's talk of it being completely open access and they might preserve um, the property completely. Um, there's some really great opportunity there for public access. So, I really feel like there's adequate public access. I mean, there could always be more, and I think we're right to continually push for more and better access, but I don't think um, at this juncture, this is the project to do it for, for several reasons that have been stated and restated. Um, so I think I think we can also distinguish this clearly from something like SAYC, because that was a condition of their approval that they would continue water access. It had always been private, but they had always allowed uh, people to use residents to use their property and so it was um, 
almost like a constructive easement, if you will. So that's a totally different story. And you did mention that it is sort of apples and orange, but I want to point out that it's, it's very different. <laughs> I, I also, I'm Pardon sorry, I also, have, I also have to agree with what Alderman Savage said about how we have all these other parks that aren't ADA compatible and that we're just kind of making up for it with this in a way. So I think that's a really valid point there. So I'm in favor of um, not pushing this particular condition at this point. I think it, it's um, there's plenty of access that we could um, point to and feel proud of and not hold up this project trying to argue this until we end up yeah, in a- I, mean, I really, I, I don't, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm, I was on, on the fence about this because uh -huh. If you just look at this project and you say, what do we want to do for the future? Let's get it right. Let's make it accessible for everybody. I mean, just looking at the context of every, everything else that's screwed up at the moment where you, if you're in a wheelchair, you can't even go down the end of the street and get on a dock because there's steps involved. It's not an easy walkway or a path to get down there. Let's do what's right for this project and we'll go back and fix all those other ones in the future. But it, there is access here. It's not like there isn't. There's going to be during the winter, and it's during those summer beautiful months that, you know, it's going to be, well, you know, we've got to maintain it for say, I, I get it. So there is public access, but then there isn't. And there's that argument of, I'd love to, we'd, let's do it right from here on out, and let's get a little path. But how valuable is it, and I'm looking at Bob's uh, condition, is just to make a path somewhere at their discretion to a bench on the water. It's like, well, we're going to go through all the time. How, how beneficial is that, to have a bench? on the water and a path and put that as a condition where hopefully that's something they'll get, they're going to have anyway during, that you can access from November to March. Uh, so yeah, it, I don't think the conditions really buying us much there. It's not like, it, cause what we're looking at with the W with the current efforts and other, elsewhere in the city is actually having a place where not only could you go sit at a bench, but you can launch a kayak. You can, you can go down to the water's edge and all that. And all we would be asking in this condition that Bob presented is much less than that which you would think would be easily done, but it sounds like there's severe pushback to that. I just hope- well, so, so a couple of things on that. Um, you know, I think, so I appreciate all the arguments that have been made and, and, and I agree with, with all of that about the purpose of CRAB and, you know, that, that's not in doubt uh, by anybody in this commission. I think if there were, <clears throat> If the layout of this 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 site were different and and there were, you know, like a, a really a huge opportunity to provide a path that that you could put a bench in as like you know something that was large enough to be sort of act like a street end park, uh, you know, I, I I might be a little bit more for, forceful about that, but you know, given that if you know you. are if you were to use any access that was given here, you'd have to be walking or riding a bike because there's no parking. And so that's the only way you'd get to it. And chances are, if you're doing that, you're probably going to stop at one of the earlier places as, as, as was mentioned. So, you know, I think given the context of the, of, of the layout, it, it, it really doesn't make all that much sense. Um, that said, and, you know, this is what I hinted at earlier is, the precedent here is do as I say, not as I do. And that really, really bothers me because when we come to the next thing, somebody, I guarantee you down the road, somebody's going to point, point to this and say, you didn't even do it on your own property. Why are you going to make me do it? And so, you know, I, that, that just really bothers me, but you know, given those other things, you know, life is all about compromises. And I think in, in balance, I, you know, I, I agree trying to put a condition on this to force something like that is in balance, not, you know, not, not the right thing to do, but the precedent does, does, does bother me. And, uh, you know, I guess we'll have to live with that. That's my worry as well. I, I'm, I worry yeah. about how much of a precedent there would be. And you know what, Chris Beard, uh, would there be a, I mean, could that be used as a precedent in the future? Or you think the ADA argument is enough? I think you've got a lot of uh, ways to distinguish this uh, decision from making it a precedent for other projects. And just listening to the testimony, there's a whole host of ways it can be uh, separated out for the future. 
And by the way, when I say precedent, I don't, I don't, I'm not a lawyer and I don't mean it in the legal sense. I mean it in the sense of pub, in the court of public opinion, because that's where many of these things are, are fought. Um, and so that's, that's it. when I say precedent, that's, that's what I mean. Okay. And thank you, Chris Beard, for that. So uh, it gives me a, a little bit more of a warm and fuzzy that I shouldn't be too worried about the uh, what kind of a scene or precedent that might set. So, okay, I'm hearing from the commissioners that uh, then forcing a condition for uh, for public access to the able-bodied on a yearly basis, so like a park bench, it, it, we're, we don't need to do that. So that that settles that issue. Uh, the, another issue is uh, noise uh, abatement for events on the property versus the residential to the west and to the south. Now, yeah, so on this, been... yeah, on this one, uh, on this one, I, you know, I, I really worry about that. Is that, um, you know, we, I don't want to make uh, de facto try to make de facto law here. Uh, you know, I think especially with the new, the new. Um, Maritime zoning legislation, they talk about events and it's, it was something that was passed and, you know, that is what it is. And that was not, might not have been my choice, but I, you know, I was not, that wasn't my choice to make. Uh, the city council passed that and uh, it is what it is. And, you know, I think we try to, you know, pursuant to the prior conversation of, of uh, constitutionality on this, I think if we try to put some conditions on that that it's not going to end well and you know like we like alderman savage said you know if there's a problem he'll entertain changing the law and, and yeah, unfortunately you know, some, think, that's think, the way that has to roll sometimes you, but, i think you're, you're going down the same route that everybody else has been going down for the same hour which is not anything of what i'm thinking in my mind i'm thinking about what do we do as a commission usually we look at a design and what do you change on the design structurally? I'm not talking about, and I never have been talking about changing what for somebody can do with their property. I'm talking about changing the design of you've got a four foot fence and you've got just some shrubs that, I mean, I'm thinking we put in a condition where better uh, fencing and or noise mitigation measures in the construction design plan that aren't currently there. Cause you have a four foot fence on the West and you have a six foot fence and you have some shrubs and the wind predominantly is a is a from an ocean standpoint from the east during the uh, summertime, I would think. So you're gonna have you're gonna have some noise there, and you, you can't tell me that they're not gonna have events to to that are gonna be there. Uh, you're just going to. And if I'm a disabled person, I want to have my event there. It'd be a fantastic venue, and you, rightly so, you should. So how do we mitigate that? And we ask, we put a condition in the design of uh, something along the line. Let's read what Bob has, and I. I had written something that's generally along the lines of uh, measures to increase noise mitigation on the west and south uh, border of the property, whether it be uh, better fencing or, uh, or even around the pavilion, because the pavilion is just open uh, to all sides of the moat. But it's a very small pavilion. I mean, you can't really do much but have a small band on that. Or, but you could have a tenant property. Somebody brought that up in the comments from the public. Please, Peter, I mean, you can have an open area. You can put a tent out there. Point is, is I don't think that the the noise mitigation in design of the actual project is handled greatly on the west and the south. So, what do you commissioners think about that? Should we address that with a condition? I think there was a letter that addressed some of the issues with, you know, the speakers were going to be pointed a certain way and that sort of thing. But that's just all that's intentions. Mm -hmm. I think we do need to put something in place. You know, I agree. Um, I, you know, I agree the noise is probably going to be a problem. And I, and I, and if it was my property, I'd have weddings every weekend because that's, if I was on a board, that's my role is to earn money for the, for the organization. So I'd have a wedding every weekend. People would rent it every weekend, I'm sure. Um, but the question is, is yes, we have been told that we basically, we, you know, we had, we got, Joel had said basically that our hands are tied with regards to use. Um, but, um, I think, I think you're going on the right path there, Ben, that we can look at maybe how can we, um, reduce this. And we also have to hope that the city starts to step up and, and starts enforcing noise issues. And, you know, up till now, they really haven't too much, but hopefully they will. And that'd be great. 
that's what I have to say. All right. So I'll, t I'll let you take before any, any other commissioners can comment at the moment, but I'll go ahead and share Bob's uh, crab condition recommendation for that. It's going to be down at the bottom. And what Bob's is, is Bob's is actually restricting use. I'd rather look at uh, putting a, a condition that goes for what your construction design is. Uh, and Tom Smith, uh, I want it, Tom, if you're still there, isn't there something that could be done with the design as it ex exists or stands to better uh, be able to block noise to the house on the west and the south than, than what we currently have? I think fencing would, would help, but what about the plantings they also propose? Do you think that's really gonna help, Tom Smith? Mr. Chairman, I'm not an expert on noise by any means, but I believe that the applicant has begun to making changes in the plantings from dogwood trees to evergreen holly trees, which yep. should assist not only visibly, but with some noise mitigation. I think in addition to fencing would be, be very helpful, yes. And the fences are only six feet, uh, I believe, which is not gonna really help all that great. But I mean, if it could be, I don't even know if the, the neighbors would want an eight foot fence or how much it's gonna benefit you. Um, Okay, commissioners, what do you think? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, putting a condition on there is problematic. I, I'd, I'd rather see, I'd rather see something changed in the, in the site design to, to mitigate that before we sign off on it. I think that's a better way, better way to go. But I, but I appreciate where you, where you're going with the, the train of thought there. Diane, you're, you're thinking, you're thinking. Well, <laughs> I don't know if I should say this, but um, I live very close to the, the Maritime Museum in Eastport and we have, there's wonderful events there. And uh, Alice Estrada, the ED, make sure that everything's closed down by nine or 10 and, and that's it. She does a great job and there's no problem. There are a couple of neighbors, well, it's in a residential neighborhood. Well, there's a marina on one side and then houses on the other side and houses all around it. And, um, I'm sure there have been times when it's inconvenient, but I'm involved with the Civic Association, as you know, and we never hear complaints. People love our Maritime Museum. The events are well done. They're very responsible. So I can only hope, and um, you know, knowing a little bit about this CREB um, organization, I, I would bet that they're gonna be as responsible as the Maritime Museum and that, that organization. So these events should be well done and limited in terms of time, but I don't think there's anything in terms of use and restrictions that we can do to make it better. And I'm not planning on restricting use. Right, right. Um, and I don't know enough about landscaping and buffering, um, you know, noise plants to know what, what, what that would look like. And frankly, I just have no idea. I'm hoping that, you know, what they've done already will be sufficient. Yeah, there is the building, which is which is a great block <laughs> that is in the way, which is good. Yep. Uh, they and, obviously thought about that, right? When they when they made it, they, mm -hmm. they did the plan. You know, can we get uh, can we get a picture put up of the actual design real quick, uh, Mr. Bollinger? Could you, I believe could you bring up a picture where it had the uh, and share where it has the building and the fencing? And just, we just want to look at that real quick and see how much where our issue may or may not actually be there. Uh, and commissioners, uh, do you feel that maybe putting a condition or a, a concern, we could raise it as a concern in findings. Uh, we don't have to uh, put a condition in there because, it, it, or we actually ask them to go back and mitigate and come back with a change in design. Uh, I'd like to, I'd like to see what the design is because there's not much more that we can do if there's if there's a building going to be right in the way between yeah. the the sound issue and the and and there then. There's no commission. There's no condition we would really do to mitigate it more. Noise is going to be the noise. <clears throat> All right. And from the applicant, do we actually have someone who can share a design picture on the screen? Otherwise, I'll just bring up my own. Can you hear me? Uh, this is Carl Kors. I'm the design Hi. engineer. Uh, I have something that I can share. Please, please share that, Carl. Actually, this is also up. So I'm hitting share screen. Am I able to? There we go. This is actually the revised planting plan. 
and we're not seeing it. Up oh, there it is. It just takes a second. All right. Let me you. uh let me rotate it. Yep. Take your time. Okay. So and let me zoom in. So this is the area you're talking about. This is the pavilion. Mm -hmm. This is the uh, Sari Math, uh, Mathias property. Mm -hmm. So what, what we've done, and, and I want to correct something about the fencing. Um, okay. the, I, I said something incorrect in the first meeting, and that was that the four foot fence was required by the state critical area. I spoke in error because the county has that requirement, but the state doesn't. So there's nothing in the city code that prohibits a six foot fence. So we're gonna put a six foot fence here. There is something in the city code. I, mean, I would also, I would all, before you do that though, I would also ask maybe the Saris don't want that. You know, if oh. they were, they're fine with the four foot and would rather have that, go with it, right? Right. And, and I also want to share that anything over six foot would violate the city's fence code. Um, so what we've done here is we've changed a couple of the big trees down here to be less uh, view shed obtrusive. But back behind the pavilion, as you can see, we've kind of stacked in these holly trees and also put in these large shrubs to sort of make a living fence between the pavilion and the adjacent property. And, you know, having some experience with noise abatement uh, on site design, it's really hard to, to do a great job of it unless you really are ready to put a, 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 an obtrusive structure. Uh, because the other thing about the fence code is you can't limit light and air. And when you can't limit light and air, it's tough to limit sound. Um, so if the Saris and the Matthiases are, want the six foot fence or want the four foot fence, I think it would work out either way. But what we try to do is put this sort of, by going with the evergreens and these dense shrubs along the backside of the pavilion, we've tried to um, make a living fence that, that will improve the sound abatement. Uh, obviously uh, not fantastically, not ultimately, uh, but between that and like you guys said, this structure here, uh, the window for the sound to move is greatly reduced. Can you can you put a uh, back wall on that pavilion facing the west? Uh, I, I I can't speak for the applicant. Um, Mr. Bollinger would have to. I don't want to agree to something that he for some reason operationally doesn't like. Uh, structurally, it's obviously possible. I'm thinking of a condition that puts a wall to the back of that, that pavilion right now on the west side to help mitigate uh, sound. And, and I mean, the, the other thing is, uh, people were referring to this as a stage and a you know, sort of bandstand. And I think the primary use, and Mr. Bollinger can jump in if you'd like, primary use is for picnic tables and lunching uh, for the disabled folks. Gotcha. Um, and, and, and obviously there's been a lot of discussion about events. Uh, they may look at this and say, what a perfect place to put a live music. Um, so I'll let Mr. Bollinger um, speak to that. And, and not yeah. only would the wall bl block anything on the stage, it would block actually, it would help noise abatement for the lawn area too. That's, the, that's the, my thought with a little wall. You in essence put a structure. Well, if you put a wall in, I don't know that it's a pavilion, uh, first off. Secondly, then you are definitely shading any of the plant material between two fences and you're not going to get it to grow or stay healthy. You're not going to get the airflow there. That's part of the reason the pavilion is being built. There's two large fans in that pavilion that will be circulating and during the hot summer months, our guests who are very sensitive to temperature uh, heat and cold would be able to use the pavilion to have lunch and be protected from the sun. So having a wall there would defeat that purpose of having that airflow. Um, we did move with the denser hollies. We can put the six foot fence in and um, the, the speakers are obviously facing towards the parking lot and not in the direction towards the sorry Matthias. And uh, 
You could have a retractable wall. I guess. Yeah, so that way you could have events and put something there in the retractable wall. It's just like, you know, when the rooms are split at the rec center and they have the retractable wall. Well, you know, even a, um, even something that's like used in the restaurant tents now about town to, to make them warmer. Yeah. Uh, it would be uh, an easy solution that would really go a long way towards sound abatement in, in the uh, westerly direction. So leaving it up to the applicant or developer, maybe if we make commissioners, maybe if we made a, uh, a condition of some sort to put some sort of removable wall uh, for noise abatement uh, to the pavilion on the west side, uh, I think that would be something worthy that that, that could easily be done uh, by the by the developer and the the developer and the applicant. And the last thing I would offer is if you could maybe also use a term like curtain or wall or multiple terms. So we have some flexibility to offer you guys some solutions. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, what would be the correct verbiage there? Yeah, we'll talk about that. And feel free to chime in while we're making our verbiage. Uh, that's very It's a barrier. It's a barrier. Who, who is that? Just like a removable barrier is how I would put it. I don't know. It's just a generic term like that. And Dave, you're 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 susceptible to a lot of noise downtown with your organizations and events. What do you think about this? You think it's worthy? Do you think it would help, or is it not really? Well, give me the real. Well, deal. I mean, it's not like it's it's it, the difference between where where I was. It was like everything would go over the water and just get louder. Um, I think it's going to be what it is, and I, I think it's going to make some difference. Absolutely, it'll make some difference to have something blocking it, but it's still going to be it's still going to be pretty loud. I think more that. You know, as long as they're a good neighbor and they do things not till 11 o'clock at night, <laughs> that kind of thing, which we kind of hope for, um, then it shouldn't be, it, it'll make a difference, I think. Okay. Would you I'm like to start? It, 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 at least it's like, you, you know, you do your best effort at least. Right. Are the commissioners then, you know, just, just have to make sure that the city steps up and, and you know, and enforces things. Alex, Diane, seeming is it seemingly valuable condition possibly to put on the design? I think it is. Yeah, I think and I think it's a logical thing. Uh, I, I, it do, yeah, it doesn't doesn't seem onerous, and uh, you know, I mean, I, you know, from from all of the interaction I've had so far, I I have no reason to suspect that. Uh, Crab wouldn't be a good neighbor, uh, you know, mm -hmm. fr from everything we've heard and um, you know, the reputation of the organization and the folks that run it, uh, you know, no reason to think that, that that would ever be a problem. And if somebody complained, they would be responsive to, to mitigating that. Um, but at the same time, you know, that uh, we have, we have been burned in the past and uh, you know, may maybe it's, Maybe I'm just feeling a little naive sometimes, uh, and and you know it sort of raises my antennae a little bit. But um, you know some some minor uh, material like that, I I think is not an onerous thing. Okay, um, so I'm I'm thinking about a condition that. Uh, set, states two things. One, it would be uh, that the applicants work uh, with the neighbors to the west and the south on, uh, and this is ge generating a rough idea before we draft the verbiage, that works with the neighbors to the west and the south on noise mitigation features with respect to the existing fencing and plantings and possibly changing those. And also changes the design to implement some type of noise abatement uh, wall and curtain and or best design choice for the west side of the pavilion or other sides as deemed proper by the applicant in their developer. So that gives a lot of leeway in the, you know, the engineers, construction architects to make it. Does that sound logical, Carl? Am I getting the rough point? Because we can solidify our verbiage after this meeting and represent it for signage. On yeah, board. I think, I think, and, and I, again, I'll 
I'll tee this up for Paul, but I think that um, as long as, yes, as we understand that it's a, it's a barrier that would be uh, uh, installed during events that have music and not something that has to exist all the time. Exactly. Does that sound too restrictive? I mean, this, we're not talking, we're not asking for the world here. It could be just a backdrop of some sort. <laughs> Hey, and we got Jim Nolan's, th uh, per oh my God. <laughs> well, um, I think we don't want to say anything about changing the design because that might trigger like a review process slow down. So well, let's just keep the, the language design, so that there's right. not a change in the design of anything. No. What is my addition of a change? barrier or Do, curtain? Do we can have minor changes in design and not have to go through the whole notification process. Tom, I mean, Smith? And to have the applicant employ a temporary barrier rather than revise the design. Yeah, I think that's what Ms. Butler well, might well, Tom say. Smith, can't we ask for minor changes in design without reapplying for notification? I'm pretty sure of that. Oh, I wasn't talking about notification. I just meant just redesigning anything is at this stage, you know, can be difficult. Well, Tom Smith, what do you yes, say? Mr. Chairman, you can put a condition that gives the staff the ability to to minor <clears throat> modifications to the design happens yeah. all the time exactly so we can but can can you clarify for for staff what you mean by work with the neighbors yeah well, that, that that's pretty wide open for me to enforce in the future uh right. it is you're thinking about what does that mean if they don't concur <laughs> Then they wouldn't. I mean, you're, we're going on good faith at this point for something like that, which that sounds appear. more like a recommendation. Right. Uh, and and I, I get what you're saying. Tom, now you're playing the devil's advocate of that. They're not good faith. <laughs> well, I'm just, frankly, when we get down to the permits and, and enforcing the, the conditions of approval, I, I like really clear language. Of course you do. Of course you do. Uh, and, and that's pretty broad open. And as Ms. Yep. Butler knows, we've been taken in the past on that unclear language. That's my only concern, Mr. Chairman. No, no criticism of your condition, just definition. And since I need time to think, Jim Nolan, please go ahead. Um, thank you. No, I, I, I can tell you right now, uh, the idea of adding something that's removable, wall, whatever you want to call it, barrier. Uh, Carl, I think, sort of nailed it down pretty well. You know, for noise abatement, you know, along the west wall of the pavilion, for use on a temporary basis, if there's some event that would create noise, I don't think it needs to be up if we have people sitting at a picnic table having lunch. But certainly if there's an event that would create some undue noise, I don't see a problem with being able to put up something that would be removable so that the rest of the time we do have the airflow and the light, et cetera. And, and that's not a problem. It's just coming, crafting the right words to cover that. And um, as far as the fencing along the property line with the neighbors, you know, I guess at the end of the day, uh, you know, a six foot fence would be beneficial for certain purposes. Um, I think that's what was considered. Uh, we, we've certainly tried to talk to the neighbors, at least crab ads. I have not. Um, and that will continue. No question about it. So it's like, let's all try to get along. I, all right. I think I think the crab could um, be creative with that barrier in the back and have, you know, one side. Yeah. They could have a backdrop that's one side they use for weddings and one side they use for other events. You know, they could. You know, we could. Do we could maybe fighting. get large. We maybe get a large uh, blow up of a photograph of the planning commission members, <laughs> <laughs> and then practice archery. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> no further right. questions. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, all right, commissioners. Uh, as Tom brought up the issue of clarifying uh, any fencing. Uh, I think that's gonna have to be more of a recommendation that they work with neighbors to improve, uh, to with getting a consensus on maybe some fencing improvements to insist with noise mitigation. So we could state that. And as far as the uh, pavilion put a condition that a uh, removable uh, noise abatement wall type of uh, imp implement be 
uh, designed into the pavilion uh, or implemented with the pavilion. We'll, we'll, we'll structure that uh, verbiage better when we come back to sign the minutes for next week, but we can get, we've got the general gist. Good. So commissioners, what do you think about that? Think we should go for it and vote on that? And I'll state a little bit more clearly. I think okay. so. But while, while I'm trying to run a meeting and type, that never really works so well. Bob always had time to do so for me. Um, so, and once again, let's look at uh, Bob's, uh, I wanna give proper, proper uh, due time to what he had written. So for the rest of the commissioners, uh, you can read what he had written right here. And we had, we've uh, just folded over on both items, uh, but not really on the second one. We've come up with a different idea rather than restricting what you can and can't do uh, on the property with events. We are, since WMI is getting a, a new uh, breath of fresh air into its rules from the uh, commission that's going on about that right now, we have handled it a different way with actually a design recommendation change or condition actually. Well, uh, to be so fair, Bob's happened. conditions, Bob's conditions were made before we had the legal opinion that we got from Joel. So gotta keep that in mind. Okay, sure. But just so you, you can read them right here, commissioners, if you want to take a quick second, give them the proper time. Yep, I had those. You did? Okay, and I've already read them multiple times. So giving up on the first one and uh, due to what we've heard testimony-wise and modifying what we're really going to do about this second, which is a condition for noise abatement structure. Okay, uh, so I will propose that we uh, approve the design as recently amended with its uh, plantings. With hey, the ben, added, ben, or actually, I, sorry, ben, can I interrupt? I'm so sorry. I I um I want to be able to um talk about just in, including the condition that says something like the lease dated November 20th, 2020, limits the use for people with disabilities, volunteers, and staff working with the lessee. The intent is to include underserved youth, wo wounded warriors, and seniors who seek access to the voting activities, uh, access to voting activities during the peak sailing season, generally October through uh, April through October. Just so it's clear in the future that it's not that this isn't limited just to um, the lease as it's written right now, and we can put it in a condition. I don't mind if it's recommendation, a right? Would that be a recommendation or not a it's condition? It's a condition, but I'm asked, I'm not, I don't want to have to go through the process of amending their lease because their lease is recorded and it's kind of a, a pain in the neck to do that. So as long as it's in the condition so that if somewhere down the line, 20 years from now, somehow people are getting excluded, somebody will at least have a, a condition somewhere they can look back to and say, this. Uh, the intent was to include these other groups as well. That makes sense. Okay, so you will have two conditions and we'll be voting on. Uh, the first condition, and, and think about how you want to state that again, Diane, but uh, the first condition will be that a noise mitigation temporary removable structure be added to the pavilion for noise abatement and also work uh, and also reassess existing fencing and plantings for further noise mitigation if possible. So the this pavilion wall, temporary structure wall would be a mandatory part. And then the other part of looking at the fencing and shrubbery again for noise mitigation would be, you know, as the developer would like to do on good faith. And the is other- that it, of, Is that second part a recommendation or is that a condition? What would you like to make it? Would you like to make it a condition that's well, developed? It sounds like a recommendation, so I just didn't know. It is, it is but if, if we could put, I mean, if you make it a condition, then they have to go look at it, whereas recommendation, they don't have to. Um, well, let's make it a condition. We'll make it a full condition because it's really still open, so open-ended. You can almost ignore it if you want to, but not really. Okay, so <laughs> in good faith. <laughs> good faith. Yeah, good faith. Good faith doesn't go far in the commission these days. Uh, Okay. And in the second, and we'll get the verbiage more straight later on. And the second condition is what Diane brought up and what we want to have in there. Diane, could you state that condition? Yeah, I just um, typed it out. So why don't I just um, text it or send it over to you by email? 
Okay, and then just state it so we can go ahead and get the vote going on that. Okay, yeah, the lease dated November 20th, 2020, limits, well, I could say between, um, you know, Crab and the city of Annapolis, um, limits the use for people with disabilities, volunteers and staff working with the lessee, period. The intent is to include underserved youth wounded warriors and seniors who seek access to boating activities during the peak season. And then I have in parens, generally October, uh, April through October, which is what's in the lease now and it's defined as their peak season. Because after that, then the general public can get on the site uh, with some other restrictions, but that's pretty much spelled out in the lease. So okay. this is really just saying we're adding wounded warriors, underserved youth and uh, seniors. To the groups that are intended to be served. Which I, Should the I, word I'm was the word also in there? Does it need to be also these people, or is it just the intent yes. is to do? Okay, so the word also should be in there too. Okay. I mean, I hope that's not a problem. I know we just close. I, can I ask? Yeah. Can I run that by uh, Paul and and Jim? Let me uh, just say this: all of those groups that you mentioned are in CRAB's bylaws and we will continue to serve them regardless. The city understands as well that we are serving them. Uh, this goes back to DNR and I really don't want to go into it, but I can tell you that we're going to continue providing this service to the disabled recovering warriors and youth from underserved communities. And Jim? I, I like what you said about recovering warriors because that doesn't, because wounded warriors is its own institution and maybe there may be issues where you don't want to deal with an institution rather rather be working with recovering warriors. And Jim? May I, may I, may I suggest because that I, I have a little concern about trying to mess around with the language of the lease, which also is consistent with the whole program open space grant process. That it's a it's a concern. Um, what I might suggest that would cover it and give something for the archives, if you will, if Crab uh, sends a letter to whomever, planning commission, the city, I don't know, you, you name it, um, that confirms what Bo just said, that it is part of our mission, it will continue at the Adaptive Boating Center. Uh, would something like that suffice? I think it gives you a historical document from CRAB, uh, because quite frankly, this is what we've been doing for 30 years. Sure, but and that's, that's great. I think it might work. The only thing I would say is that, in addition to the letter having a condition that doesn't necessitate um well, what are you doing anything a, with the lease hmm? i'm sorry you could make it a condition that crap supply a letter that would confirm that they will continue to sure anything that, that would just with, put it in writing because otherwise that, it's verbal. yeah and then you don't have to fool around with the lease which i think is is potentially problematic okay that sounds that sounds fine with me i didn't really anticipate sure. changing the lease just making it clear that the intention behind those words is broader than the actual language of the lease. So, yeah. Sure. All right. Well, we'll be happy to draft up a letter and we can supply it to whomever to take a look at and come up with the right language that would work for everybody. But I think we all understand the intent. I agree. Perfect. Thanks. All right. Okay. Um, Diane, with that said, you can modify the text and send it our way. And uh, we, we can go ahead and uh, I'll make a motion that we approve the design as amended with the recent planning changes and in addition the following two conditions that were just spoken of with regards to the temporary wall on the pavilion remove temporary removable wall on the pavilion and so be, before you make that motion uh, because then it, it will get will get into uh uh, embedded Robert's rules of order here on, on motions, which nobody's going to understand. And it, 
want to go down. But I wanted to bring one other one other point of discussion up before we move on any conditions. Sorry to take up a little bit more time. Um, and if you guys want to shoot me down on this, that, that's fine too. But, you know, again, as I harped on already about, you know, leading by example for the city here, the, the other aspect of that, that that I think we're falling down on is uh, the offsite mitigation in the fee and lieu. Uh, you know, I understand CRAB is, an, is a nonprofit and, you know, we the city's given them a good deal by greatly reducing the fee in lieu for the plantings. And you know, I understand why that's that way, but I, what I think it's important to do here is, this, especially because there is this opportunity to do some offsite mitigation very close to the site, which is obviously what, what you know, is, is the example we wanna, we wanna lead with, um, is, is that I would really like to make a recommendation, not a condition, a recommendation that that they continue to work with uh, the adjacent property owner to come up with some sort of a win-win, you know, get get an easement to, to do some plantings. You know, if it adds street trees, that that even helps to slow traffic too. Um, you know, if, if, if the easement were right up along the street where you could do some extra planting and perhaps in exchange for uh, it's something else, that's up for you guys to, to, to negotiate. but. Uh, and, and that's not really for us to, you know, as a recommendation, that wouldn't be for us to, to, to get involved in the details. But, you know, I think there's an opportunity here to, to do the right thing and to, to practice what we preach about uh, our tree canopy. Uh, because, you know, again, in every development, tree, tree canopy comes up. And there have been developments that, that got shot down because of a tree canopy issue. And, and I, I just want, I want the city not to be accused of being hypocritical here. So I'd like to make some sort of a recommendation that, that uh, you know, grab work with the adjacent property owner to try to do as much mitigation close to the site as possible. And I realize they've gone, you know, to, to great extent and that it's um, uh, no net loss. But still, you know, again, this is an example where we want to we want to have an example of going above and beyond that we that we can hold up and be proud of. So I, I'd like to to see if we would add that as a recommendation. I like that, and especially because the big open field or it's kind of like just grass that is owned by the, the last remaining Bembees, I guess, would be a great place to plant trees. I mean, however, however that works out, that's yeah. it's not for us to negotiate. No, uh, but but we can certainly recommend that 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 take place. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and again, it's a recommendation. If if either you don't want to do it, you know, you you don't do it, or if you can't come to some if you can't come to some mutual agreement, then that is what it is. But I think we I, I think it, you know as far as due diligence goes, it, it we have to say something. About I agree. Good. Okay. Okay, so now Ben, if you want to add that to the list and make a motion, all right, <laughs> you I'll, can I'll, move I'll, on. I'll, you know, I've been doing, you gave me a second to do some typing, which is great. Um, so yeah. I will read this back to you, Alex. Um, All right, a condition for Alex, continue to work with the adjoining property owners in order to develop- A, a recommendation, recommendation. Well, with what I'm gonna say is gonna be open-ended enough, so it is a recommendation, but I'm gonna make a condition that continue to work with the adjoining property owners in order to develop a possible easement to the city with respect to tree plantings. Is that small and succinct enough? I'll state it again. Continue to work with the adjoining property owners in order to develop a possible easement to the city with respect to tree plantings. Conservation easement. A conservation easement to provide offsite to mitigation. Provide, yeah. I don't know what the right words are, but to provide off, near offsite mitigation, uh, tree canopy mitigation, or you know what, or whatever the language is used there. I'm going to help us with that, I'm sure, because it's related to the. Critical area. The sale, um, 
Sure. The, the concern that I have about that is just the use of that term conservation easement and stuff like that. You're going really down a, uh, a difficult path having dealt with conservation easements before. I don't know that we're talking to apples and apples here, but uh, so I, I think- and, and that, That's fair. I don't think we have to, we don't, we don't have to mention that. Uh, you know, that would, yeah, be, worked out. Just that that would be worked out in, in the details. That's yeah, I think if we were talking food. about a recommendation that Crab, uh, you know, discuss um, alternative offsite mitigation sites on a neighbor's property or something, at least dis uh, discuss that. Um, right. Well, I know, mean, we Mr. Nolan, but we 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 know through experience that if that offsite mitigation is going to take place, those trees have to be put in some sort of a perpetual easement. But again, that's not that's not for us to work. To work out here, that's between the city and, and the applicant. The way the conditions word, it only forces you to actually work with adjoining property owners on something that you don't actually have to do because it says develop a possible conservation use. It doesn't say you actually have to. Yeah. I, well, I, I mean, right? the problem Just, is when you get into conservation easements, you're talking about having to take care of the trees afterwards and all those issues is what he's concerned about. There's a lot of it's stuff. Right. But, but I guess my mitigation, that's a different thing. Yeah, my point is there are requirements that go along. If you're going to do offsite mitigation, there are requirements that go along. That in the city, whoever in the city knows knows this. Uh, if, if you're going to do that offsite mitigation, there are requirements that go along with that. And so, you know, if that gets negotiated, those those requirements have to get agreed on, and yada yada yada. But I don't think we have to specify those. I think what all we're all we're recommending is that. That crab continue to work with the property owner to provide offsite mitigation planting or something like that. And you know, all of the details and the requirements that go into that would be part of that negotiation. But we're just recommending that? that that takes place. But you're you're classifying that as a recommendation. Yeah. If, if it's a recommendation, I guess that's fine. You know, yeah, I mean we can't we can't it, we can't we can't force you to go to go talk to a property owner to come up with a, a situation. There's, there's nothing legal that for, that allows us to, to force you to do that because you, you're right. satisfying the law by paying the fee in lieu. And you, that's your legal right to do that. But I don't think that's the right thing. And what, we're, what I'm trying to come to is get you to do the right thing if, you, if it can be a win-win. And that's, that's a recommendation. Well, that's, a, that's as far as but, we can go. Well, a recommendation again is is fine, and uh, and again we'll continue to talk with the property owners. Uh, but I, I just need to point out that one of the problems that we're having is, quite frankly, the site is not large enough to plan everything on site. That I know, and that's we, the point of offsite. Oh yeah. mit that's the the point of offsite mitigation is you can't do it on site. The next thing you try to do is find a place that's offsite that's close. And then if you can't do that, you find a place that's not closed. And then if you can't do that, you pay the fee. Because the fee is, yeah. in this case, is trivial. It's almost worthless to even pay it because it's so reduced. But that, that's just an editorial on my part. Um, but anyway. A couple different things. Yeah, there might be street tree options right along the Road. I haven't driven down there, but there's lots of things that can be done. But we're, we're just asking that you continue to to try to do that, that that's just sure. If that's a recommendation, again, that's fine. I that, put it in as a recommendation. Yeah, sure. Okay, um, I can, I'll display, uh, I'm gonna display these for, here you go, Alex. Is it a condition or a recommendation? Again, I, like, yeah, I, 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 would rather, I would rather have the word recommendation used because that's really what it is. It's not a condition. They don't, there's nothing legal that says they have to continue to do And that. I thought we weren't using conservation easement. We just said possible mitigation offsite. Pardon me, I've been typing like a madman while you're talking, yeah. so correct me, please. <laughs> so you want conservation easement gone? Um, or do you want it to read? I think we were just saying possible to develop possible offs to to you. You can say it better than me, Alex. 
Yeah. So, uh, okay. Uh, continue to work with the adjoining property owners in order to develop a possible offsite, mitig offsite mitigation uh, instead of paying a fee in lieu. Something like that. Offsite mitigation plan. Instead of paying a fee in lieu. Or in, or in addition to paying a fee in lieu. No. You know, where, where possible or something like that. In lieu of. Yeah, I hated to use lieu twice. That that's gets tortured. Okay. That's about as watered down as you can get, I think. I think that's, I, I like the intent of it though. I mean, it's, it's a recommendation. Well, mm -hmm. uh, can, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm reading what's on the screen and I'm not sure that's a complete sentence or something. I don't think it is. Uh, look, <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying. It's Since 11 o'clock. We'll, we'll, we'll straight to it out before we vote on it. to work with the adjoining property owners in order to develop a possible off-site, I, I would say... Uh, mitigation something. Mitigation mitig plan, mitigation Well, it strategy. would be tree planting mitigation plan instead of paying a field. Yeah, yeah plan so strategy. Off-site tree planting mitigation plan. I, I put that in front of the words mitigation plan. Mm -hmm. Offsite tree planting. Maybe yeah. solution. Tree planting. I think Rob and Carl want to finish or, this for uh, us. Tree, <laughs> tree uh, yeah, mitigation plan. Tree planting mitigation plan. How about we solidify uh, this with uh, Chris Beard after the fact? Yeah, yeah Chris, or, or these guys. Uh, let, let's yeah. let Alderman Savage chime in here. This is this is his wheelhouse. Yeah, that's exactly that. right. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry to interrupt. So I think you all are. I think you all are having some very good discussion here, um, getting some good recommendations and, and conditions. But just on this in particular, um, it, it does have. If it's related to mitigation, it does have to be a conservation easement. So. But I don't know if you necessarily need to specify that because it's already a requirement in the critical exactly. area code. And, exactly. and in terms of um, offsite mitigation, that, that also has to be done, considered before um, the fee in lieu. Regardless of the council reducing the fee in lieu, that doesn't, that doesn't prevent them from being obligated to look at that offsite mitigation first, be it, um, street trees or right next door or somewhere else. And I think uh, 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 Mr. Smith could clarify, but I think staff's already uh, pretty much uh, gonna be holding them to that as well. Um, but, you know, that said, I think it's, 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 it's gonna be helpful, I imagine, to Mr. Smith to, uh, to have this recommendation from the Planning Commission, just because because you are trying to make an, an effort to distill a lot of the, the, you know, all the comments you've heard and based on your own experience. So what do you, well, how should it read, Alderman Savage? That's what I'm waiting for. Come on. <laughs> it just put the words, instead of a fee in lieu, add that to what you have. To develop possible offsite tree plantings instead of fee in lieu. Yeah. I think that captures it. That's a yeah, 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 and I think adding something in terms of uh, looking at consideration for street trees within, I think you could maybe even narrow it even further, because I think the city language allows them to look on the property, but also throughout the entire city. But I think if you could narrow it even just to, if I could be selfish in, in some degree, narrow it toward seven and the immediately the immediate corridor of Edgewood Road. And Bennett Beach Road to see if there there are opportunities there for street trees. I think that would be great to kind of point them in that direction. Well, the only question I have then is that 
involve the adjoining property owners or is that the city? It would, um, it'd be both. <laughs> um, but I know the city does have, um, you know, planning and zoning it does have a list of areas where street trees could be planted. So um, that's fine. You know, I think I think putting an emphasis on that, especially if it's nearby the project site, would be helpful. But I, yeah, I don't if, you, if, much you put, if you plant them close to the road, they work as traffic as uh, traffic calming too. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was a great comment, Alex, for sure. Do you, can I interject well, just just a, a little bit? I'm sorry. Um, I just thought it might be important to point out that you're kind of killing yourself over making a recommendation to do what the city code already requires that you do. Um, but going down that road of street tree planting is actually a legitimate or a more narrow focus of, because then you can, and, and the other thing that you can cover yourself on all of this is that it's in conformance with state critical area mitigation requirements. And that covers whether it's an easement or not an easement, whether it's, you know, a, a whole host of other things. Yeah, I appreciate so that, and but you know, to a certain, just just philosophically here, I appreciate this that that we're kind of restating the obvious in a lot of ways. But for me, I think it's important for us as a commission to get it down on the record of this application, and that's why I'm making such a big deal out of it. it puts emphasis on it. So, totally. Yeah, puts emphasis on it, and and it shows that we're thinking about this and. You know, you could be if you're a cynic, you could just call it a CYA move. But you know, I'm 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 thinking of it more as as uh, you know, I want to see it on the record that 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 we we'd like that to happen. All right. So, so. as it's written right there, and it's just a recommendation, I like it. Continue to work with the adjoining property owners and the city of Annapolis in order to develop possible offsite tree plantings instead of fee and loom. Second condition is a second one is a condition, implement a temporary noise mitigating wall to the pavilion design that can be utilized during events. Also work with adjoining property owners in another work session to assist in finalizing fencing and planting with respect to noise and view shed mitigation. So all we're requiring by that is actually implementing a temporary noise mitigating wall type, and then also having a work session. We're requiring one more work session is all that really does there doesn't actually mean they have to approve your plannings or view shed mitigation. It's just having a work session so you can actually get their voice heard. And I think it's good, Mr. Nolan. Just point of order in the condition in the last line, there's a typo there, but for whatever that's worth. Yeah, where's that at? I don't know. I can't uh, it's at the bottom last line, fencing and plannings, and it says WRT noise. With respect uh, to? Oh, okay. Okay. I, I guess, yeah, we'll spell, we'll spell it out naturally. That's, that's fine. That's okay. Hey, Thank no you. problem. Thank you. The other thing, uh, Chairman Sales was in the previous discussion, it said a temporary no, noise mitigating wall or screen. Well, if you use the word barrier instead of wall, I think you are, are allowing a, a um, flexibility for it to be any number of things, whereas a wall actually has a definition in the code. Okay, we'll put barrier. All good. All right. Um, as long as things are sensibly done, I mean, come on, let's let's good faith there. People will do it. Uh, okay. Uh, and Diane, your condition. I just sent it over um, by email, and I can straighten it out tomorrow if it's not good. But I'm I'm pretty sure it's what I said. We're just including three categories, and it's going to be in writing. Doesn't have to. Um, amend the lease just clarifies the intent of the lease. But I thought we didn't really need it if we were going to get this letter from them. We can say it's, that we'll get a letter from them, but I, I think okay. we'll work on it. Sure. That's fine. And I'm going to cut it and paste it in right real quick. Give me a second. Here it comes. You're not sharing anymore, Ben. I know I'm not because I was cutting and pasting and it was unprofessional. Uh, I, I need a new assistant at work. Are you available? 
For you, Mr. Nolan, not for any price. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. Anyway, I, he I got can't it. afford you. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> I wrote it bigger so we could all see it because we're all blind at our age. All right, here we go. I I don't like, as I said, I don't like the word wounded warriors because that's a company. I'd rather have oh. recovering. Yeah, so okay, recovering warriors. Okay, sorry, change that. And this isn't a condition. This is more of a statement, isn't it, for our minutes? This is a, yeah. Yeah, it's more of a statement than a condition. Yeah. Or clarify, yeah, clarifying statement. And Ms. Butler is a lawyer as well. Jeez. But you're a much better typer, Ben. Oh. Get rid of work for minutes. You also want to say youth from underserved communities, not underserved youth, it's my understanding. Oh, yeah, that's better for sure. Undeserved youth. <laughs> 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 oh, boy. There you I, go. Really what, it's really past my bedtime. Can we just wrap it up? Uh, so, so yeah. to clarification for me, Crab does underserved youth that are not. Uh, disabled just you know underserve you yeah okay that's just, i just want to make sure that was clear okay we do but you will have the people who are bringing them out generally uh, resource officers telling right. you Got that it. there are a lot of underlying conditions with the children so to describe them as not disabled is not entirely accurate okay all I'm right saying. so you guys like that statement there any changes yeah it's just more than this. Oh, um, yeah, we can work on this later, Ben. I just don't. Sure. Yeah. Because it's just going in the minutes of what. No, we're I think it has to go someplace in the document, which contains all these conditions, as the approval, not in the minutes. It's an approval. It's part of the approval document. Okay. I think Mr. Bollinger just said include uh, youth from un underserved communities. Is that what you said, Mr. Bollinger? Yep. Yes. Yes, older woman. Okay. So change that a bit. Yeah. So just take out youth. Right. There we go. Oh, yeah. do, you want, do you want to use the word wounded warriors or recovering warriors? Recovering. Yeah. Recovering. Yeah. Recovering. Yeah. Recovering warriors? Well, the warriors told us they were wounded, but that doesn't define who they are now that they're actually recovering. And so they'd rather be known as recovering. Okay. Nice. And, and Wounded Warriors is a organization that's got some bad press to it also in the past. Yeah. So you never, you never know if you want to have something that's actually a, a company. It can be, can be construed as a company, an organization. Yeah. So this kind of covers everybody. Okay, so that generally gets it, and we'll sweeten it up. Thank you, Diane. Um, okay, commissioners, any other reason to continue to talk about this, or should we move forward? We should move forward, or stop the, or, or continue. Stop the madness. Okay. Um, yeah, it's it's after eleven. Come on, Ben. It, it is. I, hey, I'm with you. I'm I've been wanting to stop the madness for a while. I got to get up in six hours. How's the time for a motion? Thank you, Alex. All right. I'd like to move that we approve the project as amended with the following recommendation and condition and clarifying statement. And I won't read it out because we've already done that. Do I have a second? I second. I second. Any further discussion? No. <laughs> All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you everyone for your attendance and please applicant contact and work with the neighbors that still may have concern. And those neighbors, if you're still on, you can contact the planning and zoning department and make your uh, issues known and they will try to help you get in touch with the applicant if need be or possible. Uh, so it's, it's not the end of your world for the neighbors and the development that's going to be next to you. There's still some ability for you to make comment. And All right. Uh, and this item is past the us until our next meeting, where we will actually have the minutes drafted up and provided to us. Mr. Chris Beard, I believe. Yep, he's looking over there very unhappy to. <laughs>
I will uh, go ahead and get a draft up for you. All right, thank you very much. And uh, that brings us to the end of this item and moving on to, I'll stop share and I will send that to you, Chris. Uh, going back to the agenda, I can get to that. Can we say hi to Mike Malinoff? That, yeah, uh, you're, you're, if he's alive and wants to talk, does Mike Malinoff want to say anything and introduce himself at this late hour? <laughs> you're muted. You're muted, muted. Mike. <laughs> Thank you. This has been very enjoyable. And now I know what I've been missing all these years. <laughs> but uh, in all seriousness, it's it's been very informative. And the city manager took me over to this site my first day back. And I knew it was very important that this, uh, this, this move along. And I appreciate all that you've done. And thank you very much for letting me join. Welcome home, Mike. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Jim. Good to see you. Thanks for staying Good awake to, to hear this. I know, it's past my bedtime too, Diane. <laughs> for members of the public, uh, Mike Malinoff is our new director of planning and zoning. Uh, Sally Nash moved on to Baltimore County uh, to be the assistant director of uh, permitting uh, under our old uh, director of planning and zoning who stole her away up there. So uh, Michael Malinoff now has the undeserved, wow. which Diane typed in her previous <laughs> undeserved ability to show up to our late night meetings. And we thank you for that. I'm looking forward to working with you. And I'm sure you're not looking forward to working with Bob, but he's not here tonight, so at least you don't have to worry about that. So, <laughs> I know Bob. I look forward to it. Yeah, Bob knows you too. So, it's, uh, Bob, and if you're watching, Bob, there's a job to you. I, I have nothing else. Uh, miscellany, anyone else? Other items? I have 60 seconds. The, the, um, oh, Jackie. the city doc people have floated two new dates, possible dates for having um, a work session on the city dock project. And I'm pretty sure that one of the dates is probably he didn't realize what he was asking. They're December 12th and December 14th. So I've sent him back an email pointing out that December 12th is a Sunday. So um, I'm thinking that they're probably, so I, but I will be sending an email short, you know, pro, in the next couple of days with their new proffers on dates in the middle of December. So I would appreciate prompt responses to it. We're working on the Lord's Day. We're starting to have real problems, in my opinion. Uh, this is oh, okay, Ben. I'm I will tell them that. Tell, tell them. Go ahead and tell them. I'm, I'm serious. It's getting I, I actually, I, I think he must have not really been looking at the days that went with the dates when he looked at those dates on his calendar, I can't believe anybody would really seriously suggest we have a work session on a Sunday. So, uh, but, okay. um, I think it was a mistake, but I thought I was actually amused by it. Okay. Right, yeah. Happy Thanksgiving all. Thank you very much, Jackie. And anyone else have any other items before we close this out? Just thank you all very much for your service. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. That's, that's good. I appreciate it. Diane, your hair says it all. I'm done with the meeting. We're going to close it out now. <laughs> you don't I'm say that publicly. You go offline, then you say that, Ben. No, no, I'm not doing it. I'm, I'm, come on. Hey, hey is, Ben. Uh, you got to have comedy. Uh, I move that we uh, adjourn the meeting. For the second. second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. And if such, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you very much.